sees them, you might ask. Todd Linglos is on the phone, which is a uh, the uh, Job Corps. I know Todd, but thank you. Hey Spence, the document is not letting me sign. I signed it like four times, and it just keeps going back to sign and sign. So I don't know if you. Yeah, it 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 only allows one person to sign at a time, so other people are trying. So just keep trying, and it'll eventually go through. Okay, no, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Nicole, are you able to see uh, Silica the final rule? Yes, sir. Okay. Does anyone have any trouble seeing the screen before we get started? Seems okay. to be good. All right. So be before we get started, I will uh, reveal my cards and let everybody know that right out of the gate, I, I watched a little video tutorial on webinar delivery etiquette. And one of the things it said to do was uh, to not use a virtual background. And I, I think Spencer may have hit that during the orientation, um, but it, it, it can be just as distracting as, um, as trying to operate a PowerPoint and teach someone on a job site while they're operating live equipment. So um, it's also more inviting. You know, you are, everyone under the sound of my voice is actually in my home. Um, my office is in the bedroom. Uh, we are currently almost homeless. We sold our home, so we're under under construction. So uh, it's the best I could do. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you guys today about silica. Uh, silica as the final rule. Um, after this lesson, each student will be able to identify uh, silica hazards, understand the health risk associated with silica, uh, find equipment and methods to control the dust, and also we're gonna use a resource from CPWR to create a silica control plan for your next project. As you guys take this information home and you start teaching it to your students, this is a great exercise uh, to actually throw out there with the students. Um, it'll make it more prevalent, let it be known. And a lot of the people that are taking this now are gonna be able to take this back to their contract and be able to use better tools to control um, the silica hazard on their job sites. Uh, so we're also going to cover all of the resources um, that can be found for the silica as well. Silica uh, is often referred to as quartz. It's a very common mineral. It's a very common mineral found in the earth's crust. Uh, materials uh, that it can be found in is sand, stone, concrete, mortar, they all contain crystalline silica. It is also used to make products such as glass, pottery, ceramics, brick, and artificial stone. It can also be found in many materials common in a construction site, which is why we're talking about it today. In the first part of this PowerPoint, really what I want to do is to paint a picture of just how prevalent silica is in the world and in our daily lives and on our jobs as construction workers. It is literally everywhere. Silica is the most common element in the Earth's crust. I'm sorry, the second most common element in the Earth's crust. It is second only to oxygen and together silicon and oxygen make up approximately 75% of the Earth in which we live and from which we get all, uh, we get all the, that we use in our daily lives. So we're talking about a substance that is literally everywhere and in everything that we do, which means we need to be ever prevalent in the hazards associated with it. Silicon can be either crystalline or non-crystalline, depending upon the extremes of the temperatures and the pressure it has been subject to, or in some cases, the speed in which it is cooled and a solid can take on different forms. Now, I'm going to go heavily into the different forms. I just want to touch the surface of what we're talking about. Um, at the end of the PowerPoint, as I said, or at the end of this lesson, I want to make sure that you guys are able to, and ladies, are able to identify where this substance could exist and what the potential hazards associated with it are. So in crystalline substance, such as quartz, the atom and the molecules make up three-dimensional repeating patterns. That pattern is repeated indefinitely in three different directions, 
forming the crystalline structure. This is similar to floor tiles in which a two-dimensional pattern uh, unit, say one of two black tiles and four white tiles is in a repeated indefinitely in two different directions. This repeating pattern can be altered. It would be possible to change the position uh, of the two black tiles and the four white tiles in relationship to one another and still have a pattern that could be repeated indefinitely in two different directions, but the resulting design would be different. Likewise, the internal structure of the crystal can be changed and the resulting crystalline substance would be changed as well. Then we have non-crystalline state. Now picture the black tiles and the white tiles still in their same relative proportions of two to four, but randomly placed on the floor forming no pattern whatsoever, such as the structure of non-crystalline or amorphous substances. Focusing on crystalline silica, there are four terms that are often confused. Silicon, silica, silicate, silicates, and silicone. But we're gonna be narrowing our discussion down to silica, which is the compound formed from the elements of silicone and oxygen. You might know this as respirable crystalline silica. Now the structure and everything is a little scientific. You know, I get that. And absolutely not trying to make this any more complicated than what it is. But I also want everybody to understand that there are forms of crystalline silica that are dangerous depending on what we're doing with them, how we're reacting with them, or what applications we're using them in. But I also want to be very clear that when it comes to the substance of respirable crystalline silica, now precautions need to be taken. Respirable crystalline silica are very, very small. They can be up to 100 times smaller than ordinary sand that you might find on beaches and playgrounds, um, as well as in soil that's all around us, uh, sand, concrete, masonry, rocks, granite, and some landscaping materials. In construction building materials, concrete and dimensional stones known as sandstone or granite or limestone are some examples that contain crystalline silica in the form of quartz. Dimension, dimension stone is commonly used in buildings and building of churches, government buildings, and monuments. For example, the White House is built out of sandstone. The Smithsonian Institution, originally or its original build, was built of sandstone and the exterior of the Museum of Natural History is built of granite. The Treasury Building is built of granite and sandstone. Again, trying to paint a picture of how common what we're talking about is. Quartz is a component of cement and another technological development dating back to ancient times. In the past, not currently today, the element of quartz could be used in sandpaper, grinding wheels, um, all made of quartz. It was the primary abrasive used in sandblasting operations. Now we have become more educated over time and we've started to use different, sub, or different materials to do blasting operations. But to the novice, there is no difference. When you're performing the operation of blast, you're actually performing sandblasting as far as they know. And the reason that became the prevalent term is because that was the material that was originally used in the sandblasting operations. Quartz is also used in functional filler in plastics, rubber, and paint. In George Washington's time, it was, it was the fashion to add sand to your paint, thus made a wooden structure like Mount Vernon, Washington's home in Virginia, was painted with a sand paint mixture to make it look like sandstone. Crystalline silica is scien the scientific name of a group of minerals composed of silicone and oxygen. The term crystalline refers to the fact that the oxygen and the silicone atoms are arranged in the three-dimensional repeating patterns that we talked about earlier. 
This group of minerals has shaped human history since the beginning of civilization. It's, it's not new and it's not going away. As a matter of fact, they can actually make a more perfected version of this in labs and they do. They literally grow this, perfected it and made it uh, not any more dangerous, but more prevalent in society. Now from the sand used for making glass, uh, piezoelectric, quartz, crystals, long word, uh, advanced communication systems. In other words, this is from the rocks that are in our driveway to the computers that we're using right now. Crystalline silica has been part of our technolo technological development and will continue to be which means we need to understand that because of its prevalence in society, in materials that we use every day, we need to be aware of its hazards. Crystalline silica pervas pervasiveness is our technology and is matched only by its abundance in nature. It's found in samples from every geological era and from every location around the globe. So this is not something that's just in California or in Nevada or in uh, states that, that take higher precautions than some others. This is literally everywhere. Scientists have known for decades that prolonged and excessive exposure to crystalline silica dust in mining environments caused silicosis. Now believed at the time was a non-cancerous lung disease. But during the 1980s, studies were conducted that suggested that crystalline silica also was a carcinogen. So it can lead to cancer. Synthetic crystalline silica. As we talked about, perfecting those crystals to be able to make it work a whole lot better uh, is very prevalent in today's industry and does not depend entirely on natural quartz for strategic operations. Since the 1940s, well-established techniques for synthetically grown quartz have been used and refined. Now, natural crystalline silica may contain impurities or be flawed in some way. However, synthetic crystals can be flawless. They can also be made to grow in a particular shape and size for specific needs. So I wanna ask a question here, and it's really more a question of thought than anything else. If we are taking and making natural crystalline silica to be able to perfect how the outcome is, do you think that with the era of our current technology, that the safety aspects of how it could affect us was considered? Think about that. Absolutely not. I, I couldn't I, agree with you more, Ken. Same as nanotechnology and everything else. They're not thinking about us. They're just thinking about the other outcome. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would really love to go into a long debate of how uh, across the globe, everything is derived from safety, safety first. Everyone on here is a, is a health and safety instructor. It's important to you. It's important to your life. But how we deal with things that come across our desk and our way of living are only after the creation of the hazard. We are in control of controlling the hazards that are associated with technology and uh, strategic applications of different materials that are man-made, uh, both natural and synthetic. Education has made us a lot more um, a lot more aware of the hazards of associated with several different elements, even though we're only focusing on one at the moment. <clears throat> As a result of the findings, of these findings, crystalline silica has been regulated under the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, the OSHA has Hazard Communication, or HCS. Under the HCS are OSHA regulated businesses that use materials containing 0.1% or more crystalline silica must follow the federal guidelines concerning hazard communication, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and worker training. 
Although the HCS does not require that the samples be analyzed for crystalline silica, mineral suppliers or OSHA regulated businesses may choose to do so if they wish to show that they are exempt from the requirements of HCS. So HCS or the Hazard Communication Standard, um, how you guys are delivering this particular information in your OSHA 30s um, or classes that you're teaching, um, it is a good idea to institute um, in your global harmonization system when you're teaching. Um, this is a good element that really talks about several things of control and can branch off several different directions. Um, the PowerPoint that we're using today was not the original PowerPoint that I had. My hard drive crashed over the weekend, so I had to build this on Sunday. Um, but there's some really good resources that we're going to be talking about um, as we go through this. And there are activities that you can do with your students if you want to use this as a part of what you're teaching or a standalone class. Um, activities uh, specifically are going to engage your students. And we're going to be talking about visual aids tomorrow, but today I want to talk about um, things that could be added to um, this particular PowerPoint to show these activities and the hazards associated. So the hazards that can produce restful crystalline silica are abrasive blasting with sand, um, sawing brick or concrete, sanding or drilling into concrete walls, uh, grinding mortar. Also, general industry manufacturing of brick concrete blocks, stone countertops, ceramic products, and cutting or crushing stone. A lot of the on the surface things that we're talking about right now, um, if you're a painter or if you're a glazer under the sound of my voice, it's very easy to say, well, these are not activities that I generally perform. There are a lot of activities that could be listed here that you do perform. If you're a painter and you spray, you might be spraying a product called block filler. Block filler, as it's sprayed onto the wall, is going to release a restful dust that needs to be considered. Even though you didn't sand that, you didn't set it, you didn't do any of the cutting, um, it's still going to be prevalent in the air regardless of the trade. If you are a glazer and you are setting curtain wall, and forgive my ignorance here because I'm not a glazer, but if you're setting curtain wall, you're going to be drilling and tapping holes to be able to mount your, um, your material to concrete surfaces, which makes it prevalent um, to your trade that you need to be ever mindful of the hazards of silica. Now, industrial sand uses in certain operations such as foundry work and hydraulic fracturing, um, also known as fracking, is also a source of respirable crystalline silica. These dust particles are very small. So before we jump into the specifics of what the standards are, um, I just kind of want to open up a, a little opportunity for anybody to tell me, um, and I'll take it via text, or you can feel free to um, unmute yourself and tell me, what is the PEL, or the permissible exposure limit for silica over a time-weighted average of eight hours? 50. 50. 50 micrograms per cubic meter, correct? So that is the TWA over an eight hours, um, which means we know we need to do something, right? And I appreciate you throwing that out there. Was that 10? Thank you, sir. Um, what is our action level? Is there a point to where, okay, we realize that we need to, to do something we're not just going to operate under the 50 micrograms per cubic meter. We're going to have an action level that tells us we need to do something. So you might tell me what that is. I believe it's 25. That is 25 correct. 30. Yeah, 25, yeah. Yeah, it's 20, 25 micrograms 25. per cubic meter is our action level. And, and that's found in terminology that I found both on CPWR's website as well as OSHA. Those action levels are, in my opinion, just as important as the PELs that are out there to protect us. 
if we don't take precautions, if we're not aware of what these precautions and action points are all about, then we're going to get ourselves into a situation where we can't turn back. Um, the dust particles, like I said before, are very small. You can't see them. If you can see, uh, unless you're Superman, you can definitely not see 50 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, some of you have probably taken lead training where there's an exercise that's actually built in there, where you take a, uh, a sweet and low packet and you divide it up and you divide it up and you divide it up. And it breaks it down to actually talk about this is the amount over an eight hour period that you can be exposed to. That exercise translates perfect to this PowerPoint. If you can bring that into silica to talk about it, it is really a rubber where the rubber meets the road of how minute of an amount that you're talking about with your students. Now, hey, Phil, if can you're I bring, teaching, uh, I'm sorry, Kim, go ahead. Can I bring a visual a little bit, if you don't mind? So think about sitting at home, you're sitting in your chair, concentrating on a television show you really love, you're really into that show, and all of a sudden the, sh the sun shines through the window. You see all that stuff flying in the air and you're kind of waving at it, saying how dirty your house is. You forget about your <coughs> TV show and you're thinking about that dust. And then the sun moves away from the window, you don't see it no more, and then you go right back to concentrating on your television show. So it's that stuff that we don't see, that we don't pay attention to, we get complacent on that's, that's, uh, that's around us all the time. Keep your blinds closed, Ken. Uh, uh, say that again. I, I heard a comment there, but yeah, I heard a comment, I but I missed it. Keep your blinds closed, Ken. That's why my house always looks clean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree that in the home that might be a good idea, but there's not blinds on a construction site. So <laughs> a relevant point uh, from both of you. I uh, no. appreciate that. Phil? Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that kind of brought it home to me, too, was what's, and I know we've got plenty in here that know the answer to that. Um, the PEL for lead is what? Anybody want to throw it out? 50. 50. Per cubic yes. meter. Absolutely. Which is the same, right? So we're looking at the same PELs, but what's the action? What's the action level? Lead is 30. 30. So we're looking at a lower action level for silica than we do even for lead. And, right. and that, that should be a real eye-opener for most of our members. And, and, and I, I do, I, I definitely want to open this up as a conversation. And I, I think PowerPoints are best um, not to be read from, but to inspire conversation. Sure. So to, to build off of what Kevin and Ken said, um, it, this is a very rubber meets the road kind of activity that you can do with your students. And one of the things I really liked about it is I, I teach lead, I teach 24 hour lead, that's an activity that we do inside of that a lot. Um, but I don't have a whole lot of glazers taking the lead. I do, however, have a whole lot of glazers that need to learn and will be learning about silica. So if you get it in your head that, well, I don't need to do this because I know this group has already had this activity before, do it again, do it again. I learned by repetition. Uh, and so does everyone else. Definitely do it again. Um, because the, the amount of, of respirable dust that it takes to hurt you, it can't be seen with the naked eye. And then, um, so it's an opportunity to, like I said, where the rubber meets the road uh, kind of activity to show them um, how much they can see in the air. And I do have some illustrations of that as we go. Uh, some, uh, I also have a video to show just, just how much can be in the air. And just to ask a question, if you've done that activity, and I'd like everybody to weigh in, if you've done that activity, is there anyone on the, on the call that knows they have not been exposed at or above the PEL? I've definitely been exposed above. I would say that we're for, are all honest with ourselves, and Corky, I appreciate that. 
every one of us have, have been at some point. By inhaling very small respiratory crystalline silica particles that can cause multiple diseases, including silicosis. Now silicosis is a form of occupational lung disease caused by the inhalation of crystalline silica dust. So I wanna ask a question and I want everybody to feel comfortable and I want everybody to feel engaged. But if it's uncomfortable what I'm asking, then please you don't, don't feel obligated to answer. But does anyone know, anyone on the call um, have someone who's directly affected by COPD? I, I lost uh, two family members to COPD and my father-in-law is currently on oxygen. He is a retired painter from Local 47, had over 36 years in the industry. Um, he was an industrial painter. He was a commercial painter. Um, he hung a little bit of vinyl. And as I start thinking about the things that he's exposed to over the years, it is really easy for me to say, well, the reason he's in the condition he's in is probably because he was a smoker for over 20 years. Now, I couldn't agree more that that was a, a factor in why he may have COPD. But I also know that he did a lot of industrial work sandblasting and actually using sand. The, the hazards associated with this can be both acute and chronic. Can anybody tell me what those are? And I'll, I'll pick on Jason for a minute because I see him on the screen. Jason, what's acute? Acute, uh, uh, um, a lethal dose, for example, lethal lethal dose, uh, one big uh, one big breath, I guess you could say, for lack of terminology right now. I'm kind of brain dead this morning. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, something immediate, though, right? That's what you're saying? Yeah, the word chronic could be long-lasting. That's why, you know, they got to keep your records for medical exams for 30 years. So that you know, this might hit you later on down life, later on life, like a lot of these other chemicals led and so forth. And yeah, uh, Phil, as far as the COPD, I do, I do uh, deal with that a little bit as well. And I have smoked for years, still smoking, unfortunately. But the things we we deal with on the job side, it, it ain't just uh, what we do. It's just what a lot of other people do. How many times, like I said, we walk through dust clouds, man, where somebody's cutting. Uh, concrete and we don't get it in that nobody's wetting it down or doing any kind of controls with it you know yeah. it's everywhere yeah no no and and i really do appreciate that I, I know that you struggle with copd i didn't feel like it was my place to bring that out um and i know it's real easy to blame that on smoking um but i i think through education um educational moments like this uh sharing this with your students uh, can make it more prevalent uh, in their mind to take precautions, like you said, in uncontrolled areas where silica can be um, airborne and just, just everywhere on the job site. Um, and again, I wanted to open the floor. I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable. Um, if, if you believe that based on the science of what we know now about silica has directly affected you and yours. I, I gave a, a class, uh, this was years and years ago, to um, had a couple guys that were sandblasters in the, in the class. They, they, they actually kind of looked like uh, the ZZ Top brothers because they had really long beards. And they, they thought I was, um, they were a little disrespectful in the class, to be honest, but <laughs> they thought I, they, they said I was just a pencil neck uh, college kid that didn't know anything about life. At any rate, after we got talking about the effect of silica, um, the one guy said, you know, uh, I was sitting on my couch one night and uh, we were having beer after, after work. And uh, he said, out of my mouth just came blood and oh, wow. foam. And he said he ran into the bathroom and, uh, and and this foamy, bloody stuff just kept coming out of his out of his out of his mouth. Come to find out, he lost uh, one of his lungs. They took out one of his lungs and half the other. He was living on a half a lung, and it was from sil silicosis. 
and um, and because uh, he had, they would sandblast with very little in the way of any any kind of protection with with real sand, and they were poo pooing uh, our safety talks the the whole the whole time. But then uh, uh, after after they shared that man, everybody was serious as a heart attack in that class. It was amazing how that changed the way the the class went, but. Yeah, so I mean, they had uh, way. I mean, that was actually, I think, probably way worse uh, kind of reaction. But these were guys that went years and years without any PPE and just thought that that was for wimps, you know. Yep. I have a friend that's a um, retired now drywall finisher who just had gone through uh, lung cancer, and she contributes to saying that she smoked, but she hasn't smoked in twenty five years. And I try to convince her that it might be something that was on the job, but she in total denial about it. And to try to convince her that she's a drywall finisher, so that's that's in the mud. But I can't convince her that it wasn't from her having cigarettes 25 years ago. So it, it's kind of hot and I'd like her to take this class to see that this is, but she she just like wants to go on. She's in remission, but she just wants to go on and say, and doesn't believe it's job related. She's that dedicated to the to her job and to her career that she just doesn't believe that it happened on the job. And no, I Spencer, thank you for sharing and, and Deborah, I I think you really highlighted exactly what we need to get across to every person that we're teaching about silica is that society has taught us what to blame our cough on, what to blame our inability to get a full breath on. Uh, we've got to change that culture for people to believe that cigarettes are not the only harmful thing that you're exposing yourself to uh, in your nine to five job. Uh, silica without controls, as Jason said, is way more dangerous than smoking. Not that I'm condoning smoking, I quit three years ago. Um, I, qu I quit because I, I really was starting to Feel affected with my lack of energy, um, had a dry cough, and I know what you're all thinking. I've got I've got COVID. No, that's not it. <laughs> I just didn't didn't feel feel very good, and I've been out of the field for about seven years now. Um, been teaching in an office, but it doesn't change the fact that what I've been exposed to, I've already been exposed to. I can control how much I'm exposed to from this point going forward, from the day that I'm educated. And, and I took a class um, a few years ago, and I, I can't remember if it was Spencer um, or if someone that was with Spencer, uh, but he said something that I really took to heart, and, and it was also funny, and I know you guys didn't sign up for a comedy tour, but it was kind of funny too. Um, he said, everything that you've done and everything that you've been exposed to, to this point, I want you to know it's not your fault. You were just ignorant, but tomorrow you're stupid. It really is true. We've got to make sure that we educate everyone who is in or around that control measures need to be taking place, whether you're performing the activity or whether you're just exposed to the activity, that we know exactly what to do. And I, I appreciate everybody sharing. Uh, I really do. Um, I think that interaction on, on such a serious subject is very important. Um, and and we'll, we'll jump back into the PowerPoint. Um, I just didn't want to do death by PowerPoint. So silicosis is a form of lung disease that we've been talking about uh, caused by inhalation of crystalline silica. It is marked by inflammation and, scar and causes scarring in the form of nodular lesions in the upper lobes of the lungs. If any of you have ever seen, and this would be a good picture to add, if any of you have seen a nice, beautiful, healthy set of lungs in an x-ray, they're very dark because they're full of air uh, from the bottom of the lung to the top of the lung. And then if you see a set of lungs that have been um, really exposed to silica or have silicosis, there's gaps, there's transparencies in the lung. And those are parts of the lungs that are not working to be able to get oxygen. And <clears throat> uh, silicosis um, in its uh, particular acute form 
um, immediately, like Jason was talking about, um, is characterized by a shortness of breath. Um, it can be associated with a cough, maybe even a fever. Um, and then cyanosis can cause bluish skin. When your blood is not getting enough oxygen throughout the body, it can cause a continual looking blueness to your skin. And it often may be misdiagnosed as pulmonary edema. It is very important that when you're dealing with issues like this, that you are aware of what could be causing this, that you work in a construction site and that the blueness tent to your skin or that cough or that fever, what it could be associated with. Silicosis resulted in 46,000 deaths globally in 2013 alone. And that was down from the 55,000 in the 1990s. If we're gonna see numbers like this diminish, then we're gonna have to have real conversations about the hazards that are associated with silica on the job. And I may need a little bit of help here, but I wanna show you guys a video about silica exposure. Let me check to make sure that the video Hey, Phil, while you're working on this, I will share something. Um, dad, late in life, he had a chest x-ray and the doctor swore, you know, he's, he, he had diagnosed uh, lung cancer multiple times and, and he thought that he really probably had it. And so they did a biopsy and it came back negative. Uh, but he was so sure from, the, from viewing those, those x-rays that he thought it must have been an error, so he went back in a second time, but he had so much scar tissue, and he also retired as a uh, drywall finisher after a multitude of years. So it's, uh, luckily for him, he had more than 50% lung capacity than, than the, the average person, so his lungs were a little on the large size anyways, and it didn't really affect his quality of life too much, but, the bottom line is the proof was in the pudding. I mean, he had been around asbestos, silica, you name it, and uh, he had a ton of damage in his lungs, enough that they, they thought it was cancer, even though it ended up not being. Wow, sorry to hear that. And you said that was your... That was my, my father. That's your father. Yep. Yeah, very, very sorry to hear that. Um, you, you know, the, the biggest danger about silica exposure is it's not a trade-specific hazard. No, it, it's a if you if you walk on this earth hazard, uh, it it may be greater uh, to one over another, but it's definitely a hazard that needs to be considered um, in everything you do. Um, I, I remember the first time I ever took hearing protection uh, class. Um, I thought very adamantly about the things that I exposed to on the job um, to make sure that I was controlling the hearing. Uh, damage that could happen to my ear. And then right after work, I run home, fire up the weed ear, the lawnmower, and shoot the shotguns and, and never consider that, oh, wait a minute, this is a hazard that could exist outside of the construction site. It's not just right here. It's everywhere. Um, so I'm going to hit play on this video. Um, and Kevin, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I did. Um, and if you could let me know if everybody can hear it and see it. It's real low, Phil. We can see it, but its real volume is low. And building props like there you go. That works. So, are you able to hear it and see it or no? Ken, I couldn't hear you. Right at the end there, we could hear it and we okay. could see it for sure, but some. Um, silica. 
is one of the most common substances on Earth. It can be found in materials like sand and rock, and building products like concrete and brick. When a worker cuts, grinds, or drills materials that contain silica, dangerous crystalline silica dust is released into the air. <coughs> As the worker breathes, silica crystals flow into his mouth and nose and down the air passages deep into the lungs. The tiny crystals enter the small, fragile air sacs. But immune system cells called macrophages engulf and try to dissolve the crystals, but they are unable to. Over time, more and more crystals build up inside the macrophage cells. The macrophages carry the silica into the walls of the lung, where they die. Scar tissue forms around the dead cells and spreads as more cells die. This damage can continue even after the exposure to silica stops. Eventually, so much scar tissue forms that the lungs can no longer function. For information on how to protect yourself from silica exposure, visit worksafebc.com. Okay, so I'm trying to share uh, share back uh, with where we were, and it is giving me a fit. That's okay. Um, but I want to ask you a question. Um, based on the video that you've seen and, and everything that we've covered so far, um, what is what is the cure for for the exposure to silica or silicosis? Anybody tell me what the cure is? None. There is none. They can only stop the progression, but there's no known cure. That is exactly right. Once you've been exposed to this, there's no um, chelation therapy. There's, there's really nothing they can do except make you comfortable with what you've already got. And I would love to tell you that there are ways to take the progression and move it backwards. And that the cells will rebuild themselves or that the, the lung walls will repair themselves, but they won't. This makes this reaction to this hazard also acute. We have to be mindful of what can we do. Silica as an uncurable or an incurable lung disease that can lead to disabilities and even death. Respiral silica also cause lung cancer chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that we talked about, or COPD, and also lead to kidney disease. And if you're wondering if I'm trying to scare you, yes, yes I am. Um, and not, not because I, I want to do it, but uh, because I want you got everyone to be mindful of the hazards. So we've learned a little bit about the hazards, we've learned about the material that it can in, we've learned about how many different ways that we could be exposed to it, but who, who is at risk from exposure to crystalline silica? I mean, if it appears in, in this substance and it appears in that substance, um, really, let's, where's the rubber meet the road? Who is at risk? And, and the truth is around 2.3 million workers are in the job. Um, simply being near sand or other silica containing materials is not necessarily hazardous. Uh, the hazard exists when specific activities create respirable dust that are released into the air. So what kind of activities? Um, well, construction workers. Uh, the percentage of workers that are exposed to silica by exposure, and I've included a few different charts that you can go over with your students. 
um, by exposure level, construction versus all other industries. So here on the left-hand side of the column, we have percentage of workers, and then as their exposure based on micrograms per cubic meter, uh, which we talked about earlier. So specifically in construction workers, okay, being red columns, and all other activities being the blue columns, 16% um, of construction workers are exposed between zero and 25 micrograms per cubic meter during the operations of construction. So let me ask you a question. What was the action level that we talked about earlier? 25. 25. So if 16% of construction, think about that. Break that down into your, into your home area. Okay, there's 100% of the work that's out there in construction. We have a membership. Maybe we have a market of and I'm just going to be, be big. We got 20% we got of that market. So out of that 20%, 16% of your construction workers on that job are exposed at the action level every day. Mm -hmm. Now between 25 and 50, which goes closer to our PEL, is 4.3%. And then between 50 and 100, you'll notice that number jumped. Um, between 50 and 100, to 5.7. Now the reason that number jumped, it simply boils down to this. We, we have to educate our members. <clears throat> and I know it's unfair to say we just need to educate our members because the truth is I'd like to educate every person in construction, whether a union member or not. But we gotta start somewhere. And we start with our guys and then the control methods and the things that they're putting into place will become known as to, hey, you know, I remember when they used to saw that dry. Why are they using water now? Or, hey, I remember when they used to not wear a respirator um, to use that powder actuated tool into a concrete ceiling. Um, little things like that will eventually start to add up. Now, the number that's scary here is 4% of construction workers are at an exposure rate of 250 micrograms per cubic meter. That's a lot. Five times the PEL. All right, so let's look at it a different way. The percentage of construction workers exposed to silica by exposure level and construction subsectors. So if we look at the subsectors, we have first our criteria of micrograms per cubic meter based on the color chart. Uh, purple being zero to the action level, uh, amber being uh, 25 to our PEL, so our action level to our PEL, uh, and so on and so on. So we can find um, something that directly relates to us in this chart to know where we are. Um, so let's look at uh, building and finishing, okay? So if we look at the red red area there, which is greater than 200 or five times the PEL, we're at 23.1% as a whole on that job. So we're not talking specifically just about the painter, about the glazer, about the hydroblaster. We're talking specifically that job and how it operates and how many people are exposed to five times the PEL on one construction site. And the long and the short of this chart is Everyone has skin in the game. Everyone needs to do what their part. All right, so last chart, uh, kind of same as the one before, um, just breaks down some different jobs. Now, question for you. Has anyone been on a project where demolition is going on on one side of the building or right next to where you're working at the same time you're doing finishing work? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> so it, it's the responsibility of whom to control the hazard. That depends on the contract. It could be the controlling, correcting, exposing, creating. Very, very good. It, 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 and it can, be, it can be different factors. And when you're on a construction site, the truth is we could spend a lot of time yelling at who's at fault, 
who should be doing this and who should be doing that. But the reality is educating our members to educate our members to educate our other trades is what our focus should be. So here we have exposure contaminants such as pollutants, gases, dust, and odors at work selected, um, selected occupations. Um, so our ex exposure, and we just picked one of those, we work directly uh, as a foreman on a job, and this is probably more geared toward uh, general industry, so someplace you go every day uh, in a constant, consistent environment. Um, so our foreman exposed 75 micrograms per cubic meter every week. So if we work in this environment, what is our action level to start doing something about it? 25. 25 micrograms per cubic meter. All right, so the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, uh, regulations in 29 CFR 1926.1153 requires, okay, when you're, when you're teaching, um, when we're talking about the requirements, they are, they are prudent to be able to mention. But your focus when you're delivering your material should be based on hazard and hazard prevention. The law is going to be there whether we do that or not. But if you're presenting this information in a manner that makes them feel like, the law says, you're, it's gonna go over like garlic flavored certs. It's just not gonna happen. You're gonna have to deliver this material as a concern to make sure that they understand that you are concerned about their safety and that they need to be concerned about their safety. The laws were created so that we get home to our families at the end of the day. The law more applies to them um, it will apply to them better based on the delivery. So construction employees, uh, the, the law is so that construction employers to keep workers exposures at or below a permissible exposure level or a PEL of 50 micrograms per cubic meter. If they're not following that, they have to comply with table one, which is a specified exposure control method when working with materials containing crystalline silica of the silica standard. Now what I did was I didn't put the whole uh, table one in here, I just took a snippet of it so that you guys can understand how it works. And the table's available both on OSHA's website and on CPWR's website. And it, it is actually a very good tool just to quickly understand of what, what actions you need to take based on the activity that you're performing. So I just chose one just to pull it out. And if we're doing, if we're using a handheld power saw, regardless of the blade's diameter, okay, that's the equipment, that's the task. And then it says engineering and work practice control methods. Notice it didn't jump straight to PPE, which on the hierarchy of controls is number four. It immediately went to engineering controls. So the engineering controls are going to be different based on which one you choose. So if you use a saw equipped with an integrated water delivery system that continuously feeds water onto the blade, what type of respirator do I need? Don't need one. I've already controlled the hazard by use of engineering controls. I don't have to use a uh, a half face air purifying respirator with an assigned protection factor of 10 because I've already minimized or eliminated the hazard altogether. That should be our goal with every activity is trying to figure out which one is not going to constitute using or having to use a personal protective piece of equipment. Air purifying respirators are great, but there is a problem with them. They're not 100% effective. That's why they have an APF. So if, if I'm operating or maintaining that tool in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions to minimize the dust emissions, do not have to wear a respirator. But when I'm using it outdoors, um, or when it's used indoors or in an enclosed area, now it recommends using a half-face air purifying respirator with a protection factor of 10. 
So if it has an APF of 10, what is the maximum concentration that I can use that particular respirator for? Can anybody tell me? 500. How did you come to that number? Because yes, you are correct. That's the PEL. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Ellis, could you say that one more time? Times the PEL. That's right. You take the assigned protection factor and you multiply the PEL to so you know the maximum concentration that that mask will work. Cool. All right, good. Sometimes I forget I'm teaching 502 instructors. You guys are awesome. All right, so OSHA regulates 29 CFR 1910.1053. This requires that employers cover by general industry standards, including oil and gas to keep workers exposure at or below a PEL of 50 micrograms per cubic meter. Now, how often or how are workers in general industry and maritime exposed <clears throat> to respirable crystalline silica? Most of us think about general industry, well, we're talking about cops, right? Doctors, lawyers where they trip over and scuff their knee on concrete, got a little dust in the air. There are a lot of industries that deal with silica in, in general industry. Workers can be exposed by uh, manufacturing glass, um, making pottery, ceramic, brick, concrete, asphalt, roofing, jewelry, artificial stone, dental implants, uh, porcelain or structural clay products. Uh, the use of industrial sand in operations such as foundry work and hydraulic, uh, hydraulic fracturing and also in the use of sand abrasive blasting in maritime operations. What does the standard require then? It re requires that we determine the amount of silica that our workers are exposed to if it is or may reasonably be expected to be at or above the action level, which we drove home pretty well, the 25 micrograms per cubic meter of silica at, on average over an eight hour day or a TWA. Now we have to protect workers from reasonable crystalline silica exposures above the PEL of 50 micrograms per cubic meter, again, over an eight hour day. So I want to pause right there and I want to open the floor up to ask you another question. What means can I use, what tools can I use to determine what is my PEL in my environment? A personal air monitoring system, one that you wear goes over your shoulder or an area uh, air monitoring system, going okay. through a, a cassette and collecting the the surroundings and, and then they'll, they can read that or, or examine that to tell you what's in the uh, surrounding areas. Awesome, thank you Ken, I appreciate that. Now, if you take what Ken said and it is 100% true, do you think there are tools out there that show us during the cutting, the drilling, the blasting operations, those numbers are already predetermined that we could follow? Yes, they're already there. In table two, or I'm sorry, table one, it actually shows us these are the precautions that you should take. These are the things that you should implement so that you can limit, the, limit how much your exposure is. There are engineering tools, administrative tools, all before we get to number four, uh, personal protective equipment to control the measures. But you don't have to just control the measures of what your exposure is. You also have to limit exposure to workers around you, which means you have to control the dust and use safe work practices to keep the PEL down. There are, there are a lot of what I would call the explosion of silica safe tools. As we go through, we'll, we'll dive into some of those um, and then if anybody wants the information, I can, I can add several links where everyone jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, Bosch, uh, Hilti, uh, everybody's creating tools that really help to control those hazards. Um, providing respirators to workers when the dust control and safe work methods cannot limit the exposure 
is required um, that your contractor or their contractor provide them. Um, establishing and implementing a written exposure plan or control plan that identifies that Im involves exposure and method used to protect workers. When that was first come out, a lot of people were, um, I would say, apprehensive on how do I build the plan and then how do I deliver the plan? And no one wants to be embarrassed. I completely get that. Uh, contractors are not any different. They're real people who uh, most of the time want to do the right thing, but they don't know how to build the plan. CT CPWR actually took, um, and they have a website we're gonna go to here in a little bit, and we're actually going to build the plan. Um, what I'm gonna do is we'll, um, if I get Nicole's help, maybe break off into some groups and figure out how to uh, write a plan based on a hazard that's known to us. Uh, but you have to establish and implement this written plan. And there are two words you need to pay attention to, should and shall. This is something you shall do. You shall establish and implement a written exposure control plan that will identify the task involved in the exposure and the methods that you're going to use to protect the workers. Restricted housekeeping practices that expose workers to silica, such as the use of compressed air, um, ventilation systems that capture dust by dry sweeping, um, where it's effective, safe, and alternative serves are available. Offer, offer medical exams, including chest x-rays and lung function tests every three years to workers who are exposed at or above the action level for 30 or more days per year. So even if you're controlling the hazard, if there is the potential for someone to be at or above, not the PEL, the action level, you need to have x-rays and they need to reevaluate um, based on what your findings are. And this is all for every single employee who does this at a level of 30 days or more per year. So you wanna train your workers on the health effects of silica exposure, workplace tasks that can expose them to silica, and ways to limit the exposure. In 20 CFR 1910, record keeping, records of the air monitoring results and objective data must be kept for a period of 30 years. Uh, I believe Jason actually said this a little bit earlier, uh, medical records must be maintained for the length of the employment plus 30 years. Okay, so that needs to be clear. You're going to keep the records during the entire time that employee is with that company and then 30 years after. Now, air monitoring data, the employer shall, there's that word again, make, a, a make and maintain an accurate record of all exposure measurements taken to assess employee's exposure to reciprocal crystalline silica as prescribed in paragraph D2 of this section. The employer shall ensure that the exposure records are maintained and made available in accordance with 29 CFR 1910.1020. So what we've covered so far is the hazards, but if we boiled it down to um, you as a worker, what your skin in the game is, what your protection, what your involvement needs to be. Now we're covering the employers. The records shall include at least the following information. The date of the measurement for each sample taken. The task monitored. Sampling and analytical methods used. The number, the duration, and the result of the samples taken. Identity of the laboratory that performed the analysis. Type of personal protective equipment such as respirators that were worn by employees, monitored, and the name, social security number, job classification of the employees represented by the monitoring, and indicate which employees were actually monitored. So the contractor's got a little bit of work to do to make sure that we're safe. We know if we're in the field, is this being done or not? Now, the objective data, the employer shall make and maintain an accurate record of all objective data relied upon to comply with the requirements of this section. 
This record shall include at least the following information. The crystalline silica containing miracle uh, material in question, the source of the objective data, the testing protocol and results of the testing, a description of the process, the task or the activity on which the objective data were based, and the other data that would be relevant to the process, the task, the activity, the material, or exposure on which the objective data were based. And then we have medical surveillance. The employee shall make and maintain an accurate record for each employee covered by the medical surveillance under paragraph H of this section. The record shall include the following information about the employee, his name, her name, social security number, copy of the physician or the specialist written medical options, and a copy of the information that's provided to the PLHCP and specialist. Okay, protecting workers from the hazard. I'm gonna, I'm gonna attempt this again. I've got another video that I want you guys to watch. It's short, um, but it's very good. Um, any questions so far? Okay, try not to be boring, I promise. Hey, Phil. Yes, sir. Um, if you, you're playing your sound, actually it's looping through your microphone. Oh, okay. Rather than being played straight from the computer. So in order to do that, I don't know, do you have access to this video uh, if you get out of your PowerPoint? Um, I can have, yes. Okay. So what you want to do is, is um, stop sharing your screen. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me pull the link. Okay, so then then go click on share screen. Once you once you open up the dialog box that's going to help you select whatever you're going to share. Okay. Bef before you select before you select it. <laughs> back up. Gotcha. Before you select it, there you go. Before you select it in the lower left-hand corner of that window, there's two little boxes that say share computer sound and optimize for video. Gotcha. So if you click those to then share your screen, now we'll all get blown out with the sound. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna blow this up and Looked like it was on mute. Here's some yep. most common minerals. Thank you. Crystalline silica is one of Earth's most common minerals. It is found in stone, brick, rock, concrete, block, mortar, asphalt, and sand. Using power tools on these materials for tasks such as cutting or grinding can release tiny particles of silica into the air. These tiny particles are known as respirable crystalline silica. Workers who breathe in respirable crystalline silica can develop diseases that can be life-altering or deadly. Traditionally, on construction sites, silica with, with grinding and, and cutting produces a, a lot of dust. It gets into the workers' lungs. Exposure to respirable crystalline silica can cause silicosis, a disease that permanently scars the lungs. It can also cause lung cancer, kidney disease, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD. The chances of developing these diseases increase with higher and longer durations of exposure. What we're looking at on the left is a normal lung. You can see that the lung tissue on either side of the heart is uh, dark and black, and that means it's full of air. 
And the x-ray on the right, you can see those white scars throughout the lungs on both sides. That's all scar tissue. Is from a patient with advanced silicosis. Without protection, workers who are exposed to very high levels of respirable crystalline silica during activities such as abrasive blasting with sand can develop silicosis within a period of months to a few years. Workers usually do not develop signs of silicosis until after they have been exposed for 10 years or more. Once silicosis symptoms, such as shortness of breath, appear, the symptoms can get worse over time, even after the worker stops working with silica. Usually people who develop silicosis have been very healthy, vigorous people, and they find after years of the disease that they're short of breath, that they can't go very far, they can't walk very far, uh, they can't climb the stairs, they may even be short of breath just sitting still. I continue to see new cases of silicosis, and yet there is still no treatment. So I would like to see prevention of silicosis so that this disease is eliminated from our hospitals and our health clinics. Silica disease can be prevented by controlling exposure to silica dust. Water can be used to wet the dust and prevent it from getting into the air. Vacuums can be used to remove the dust at the point where it is made. We stir up a lot of dust, so we try to prevent as much of it getting in the air as possible. So we use these vacuums. But while we're working on the, cutting the joints out, we create a lot of dust which we collect in the vacuums inside these bags. Much rather have it in this bag than I would inside my lungs. Once I tried the new things, it worked well, because at the end of the day, I went home without silica dust in my lungs. I went home clean at the end of the day, and I got used to it. Gary Sassy's family business is stone carving. His father and his grandfather both died of silicosis. I believe that our industry here has worked hard to uh, bring in new technology that does help with the silicosis problem. I also believe that there's also room for more education for the workers themselves to understand the critical reasons why they have to be very careful in this industry. In today's climate, we stress to our customers safety, financial stability, company stability. We remind our men we want them to go home same shape or better shape than when they showed up that work that morning. OSHA's rule for respirable crystalline silica requires employers to protect workers from silica dust to prevent them from developing disease. Silica related diseases can be prevented if proper controls are used to reduce workers exposure to dust. More information on OSHA's requirements to protect workers exposed to respirable crystalline silica Okay, so can everybody still hear me? Yep. Yep, thank you to Mr. Schwagler for that. I will not forget how to do that again. Um, so as you can see, um, it, it's something that's pretty prevalent, um, been going on for quite some time, and doctors are becoming more and more aware of the hazards associated with silica exposure, and they're demanding to make sure that we're doing something about it. Um, if you've been on a typical job site, you know, it might, um, it might look something like this. Does that look pretty familiar to everybody? Did I lose you? We're here. Uh, we got we got here. We're here. Okay. It looks it looks it can kind of looks like a job site for sure. Yeah, for some reason I'm not uh, not seeing you guys. Um, so cancel. We can okay. see you. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so here's a pretty typical job site. Um, you know, I've been in the trades for for quite some time now. And my first job sites were a lot like this. Um, you know, went through there, um, through these job sites, not realizing that dust um, could be as hazardous as, as we're talking about today. 
um, there's been a lot of innovation and tools to be able to take a job site that looks like this that now can look like this performing the exact same operations there are a lot of tools and no i'm not working directly for hilti it's just uh, they had some good pictures to illustrate my point uh, but there are a lot of good tools out there um, the more pictures that you can use to illustrate these points with your students um, it's going to directly relate to their activities and you may actually show them that tools that they didn't know exist are available. <clears throat> so here we have, um, and, and we'll just go from bottom, we'll make a full clockwise uh, circle. Our innovative line of vacuums, okay? Help control dust, uh, dust thanks to 99% filter efficiency or HEPA. Uh, ready, solid, separated, self-cleaning filter mechanisms up to 129 CFM. Uh, the concrete uh, grinding hoods or vacuums work together and reduce restful dust, um, as you can see there on the left-hand side. Concrete chiseling, uh, breaking combined with the Hilti shroud, um, Hilti vacuums are under OSHA Table 1. Uh, direct fastenings utilizing uh, methods like Hilti gas powder or battery activated fastenings does minimize the need for grinding in a simple one step operation. Uh, dry concrete cutting. Use a Hilti vacuum to control the dust with application. Check the CFM ratings uh, on your vacuum to ensure that it complies with OSHA's Table 1. Everything's going to come back to a lot of good resources um, for silica. What I did was I put in the PowerPoint, we're not going to visit them today, but I put a couple really good resources for silica here. Um, OSHA, this takes you directly to the topic of, um, of silica. And then CPWR has a lot of good tools as well. I would recommend, as Dave said, um, visit these sites and visit them often before you teach because uh, there's always something new being added. So here we have the OSHA fact sheet. With every subject that you teach, you should be handing, doing some sort of handout. And one of the handouts that I use is the OSHA fact sheet because it walks through table one. It talks about construction workers that are exposed to restful crystalline silica. Um, it's just a good point to uh, just to re-edify what you've been teaching the whole time. Um, and if you don't have it, it's available on OSHA's website, and it's also available on the link through CPWR. Uh, and that's second page. And then <clears throat> OSHA's Respiral Crystalline Silica Standard for General Industry. Also a good one. It illustrates some of the same points, but also changes some stuff up. Uh, it talks about providing respirators to workers when the dust exposure is to the PEL, not over the PEL, to the PEL. Um, this particular gentleman here on the left hand side, um, he's been working with concrete uh, for a lot of years. He's actually third generation, has been doing craft work in concrete. And both his grandfather and his father passed away from COPD, direct complications to silica. Uh, there is a video on uh, OSHA's website that talks a little bit about him and what things he's done to change uh, in his job so that his next generation is going to be able to live a long and healthy life. And then silica toolbox talks. These are always good to hand out. Um, I hand these out during our uh, OSHA 10 and our OSHA 30. Try to hand out at least a toolbox talk related to the information uh, that we're using to be able to take back um, to their job sites um, and then talk about how they can remain safe. If someone in a foreman role or leadership role is talking about safety, um, a lot of people will follow suit. Um, you're condoning safety on a job site, which gets them more actively involved. Uh, even if a contractor doesn't require or if a job site superintendent is not requiring um, you know, to a certain level of frequency that you should be doing a toolbox talk. 
Um, CPWR has a lot of really good ones that you can pull off their site, um, print them off and go over with the crew uh, either once a week, once a day, or, or as often as you think it should be done. Um, I would highly recommend that if, uh, if it's directly related to the task or the work that you're doing that day, um, that you hit it in the morning uh, before you get started. Um, CPWR issued this physical alert. Um, I can't remember the exact time frame, um, but I remember putting this up and it was um, occupational silicosis uh, and silica as a related illness among construction workers. Uh, the more prevalent that you can make this hazard by posting these, handing these out, um, you know, handing them out with a toolbox talk, um, just so that they're aware of what's going on constantly, because I guarantee they're probably not visiting these sites as often as we are. Uh, the alert was developed to ensure that all of the construction workers who engage in the work could expose themselves to respiratory crystalline silica and put them at risk of developing occupational silicosis or other silica related illnesses and properly diagnosed. So please read this alert. Uh, Keep it best practice tips to help your work safely and fill this in uh, to my doctor form and give it to your doctor and include your medical records. Um, this is kind of a way of promoting to your students that um, this may be something that you've already been exposed to and that if you don't take action now and control it, uh, it's only going to get worse. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing anybody on my screen, but here is a hazard alert also produced by CPWR. Um, this, this is kind of my go-to handout when we talk about silica in our classes. Um, it, it narrows everything down or summarizes some really key points um, for silica. For example, it, it throws out some elements that silica can be found in. It also talks about activities um, that it can be released to uh, respirable form. Uh, it talks about why it's deadly. It talks about um, how it can cause lung cancer. And it, it really talks about some prevention methods that you can use that are really going to be helpful as well. And you can learn more about silica. They added these QR codes uh, to a site called Work Safely with Silica. This is my go-to resource uh, for everything silica. If you have the students, teach them how to use it. Just scan that QR code right with their phone. It'll take them to the website and they can get to pretty much every resource that we have covered so far uh, just by these three QR codes. Uh, work safely with silica. Um, it is something that I've used quite a bit, but not from a contractor's view, more from a student so that they're aware of how to use it. Uh, with this Work Safe with Silica, you can use this as a one-stop resource uh, to help your contractors. You can create a plan. Uh, step one is to select the material and the task that will generate the silica dust on your job. Step two is select the equipment and the dust control method for each material task uh, and combination. Uh, selection in step one. And then step three is fill in other job site details and elements of your silica control plan. Now, once you do this, then you also have to ask yourself, you know, is this working? Um, are these steps working? What's great about this site is you can set it up to where once you log in, it doesn't cost you anything. You can log right in and you can create these control plans. You can save them, you can modify them, you can email them directly to job site foremans, to, uh, to specific people, um, and we're gonna get to do it. So the next step is, uh, and I might need a little bit of help here with, uh, let, me, let me stop sharing real quick. So Nicole, you still with me? Yes, sir. All right, so tell me if I'm out of my realm here, but is it possible to take our group of 20 
students and um, I want to see if I can copy this link. I want to be able to send them I want to be able to break them into groups um, so that each each group, if possible, can actually go onto the website with really no formal instruction, walk through it so they can find out how easy this is, and then share their plan with the rest of the group. Is that possible, or should I just ask them to, um, or should I just put in the chat box the link for the Work Safe with Silica? I would put that in the chat box, but it is absolutely possible to put everybody in a group. Um, those of us who, so like me, Ronald, and Monisha are also counted, so so will Spencer, but you guys can just drop out of the group or I can try to remove you as well. But um, we can absolutely do, I have four, I have three groups set up. I can do four groups um, and do it that way for less people in the group. Okay, um, and I'm not opposed to everybody just kind of jumping in and giving this a shot. Uh, an opportunity to, um, to see how easy this is, um, to see how effective this is, and, and to uh, put it into your OSHA 30s um, and your standalone silica classes uh, to be able to utilize as a tool. Um, what I did was I went ahead and uh, typed in the link. Um, so you just uh, cut and paste that out of your browser or you might be able to just click on it and go from there. Um, I'd just like to take about 10 minutes, um, have everybody uh, go to the site. It will take about five minutes to create your account. It'll take about five minutes to um, create your plan and then bring it back to the table to find out um, what you guys thought of it and uh, if anything could be improved or if there's anything that's not quite there. Fair enough? All right, so in your chat box, I sent it to everyone. There's a link for the site. You can just left click on it, Phil, and it should open up in a browser. Right. See the link in the chat though? Everybody kind of ready to go? Just a head nod here or there? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to put you in your groups. It'll be automatically set up for 10 minutes. It'll count down when there's 60 seconds left in your group and then we'll bring you back into the main screen again. Okay. So I'm going to open up all the rooms right now. See you all shortly. Awesome. And then Corky, is there, did you get a pop up on your screen that says we're going to put you in a, um, in a, in a room? I want to check your screen. You might have to accept it that I'm putting you in a room. Oh, and you're muted. Sorry. And then Jason, same with you. Do you have a pop up in your screen that says you're going to go to the room?
Let's see. Well, hello, Corky. Use your space bar, Corky, to speak. All right, Jason and Corky, can you guys hear me? Okay, so Jason or Corky, can you guys hear me or no? Can you give me a head nod? Okay. Um, and nothing popped up on your screen to go to a breakout room? Can you take your mouse and scroll to the bottom of your Zoom window and see if there's something that pops up there? Or it might be something at the top of your Zoom window. Hello, everybody in breakout room one. We had some new participants uh, join your group. Just wanted to alert you. Not sure if you guys are talking or wanted to just say hello. Uh, we got Corky and Mr. Sims in your group, and I joined too, just to say hello. So if you want to bring everybody up to speed on what you're working on, we got two minutes remaining. Uh, we're filling out the registration part. Uh, I think we're. Uh, step three, Sean? I think you're yeah, step to. three. We're going with uh, step three. <laughs> paint containing lead, and we're going to the abrasive blasting. I guess we're going to go with water assisted blasting rather than the PPE. And I guess Sean, right now, by default, he was the one to fill it out. <laughs> he stepped <laughs> up, we all stepped back. He didn't step. <laughs> so I guess we're. Filling out that part. Yeah, I mean, this is how would help if we had a like a predetermined job or task or something. We're just kind of pulling stuff out of thin air, what we want to do. All right, when we get everybody back together, we'll we'll mention that to Phil or we'll put something in the chat so we know for next time to be a little bit more um, prepared for these, this little activity here. 
Yeah, you know what? I think Sean's right on this. You know, like one of those little case studies where they give you the, the scenario, what happened and everything, or, you know, something like yeah. that. And they go on and fill it out from there, whatever. All case right. study. I think Adolf just nominated himself to be the one to break the news. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that clown should go. learn how to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, very good. I'll see y'all shortly. Now you know why you should wear your respirator all the time? <laughs> Young kids, we got uh, absolutely. Jason, I was digging around the other day and come across an old sheet that had a a young Jason Cornett in it from a two oh seven two thousand and seven uh, OSHA five hundred. I was got you. Bet, uh, we were in there, both you and I. Actually, Gary Van Buren was was teaching it, but. Uh, we got uh, Jim McAllister, too. Yeah, that was one of the first classes in the uh, in the, uh, FTI. We stayed. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mallory. That's uh, pre Harley Davidson right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did feed you good the Maritime, though. I never got to make the Maritime. Yeah. Nope. They had oh, a yeah. big kitchen with a lot of food. <laughs> Man, first time I seen that layout, I was like, oh goodness, where am I going? This, hell, this is just lunch. <laughs> I did my first teaching tech over there years ago, I think in 2006 or something. How's it going, Andrew? Been working through that plan? Uh, yeah, it's, it works out pretty good. It runs all the way back to, you know, all the standards from housekeeping to tools. And... You know, Ken, I also, um, with that, because it gives you a lot of different options, whenever you select one, you get another drop down, like a flow chart. I was, I was able to print off several for those tasks of the sheets for those uh, classes that we didn't have internet access so that they could actually kind of go through and check the boxes too. They would see what would pop up. And that, that was helpful for the cases to where we, we couldn't get online and do it. Yeah, and then you can print or email or download the, the plan. Yeah, so that's, pretty yeah that's awesome. Yeah. Pretty easy to do, Andrew. I'll use it again. Cool. You know, it's not a bad idea for us to do that for our training facilities. For yeah. our backup areas, absolutely. It'd be good for the students to come up with their own plan. Absolutely, and then we could save it, and yeah. you know, it's it's great. Uh oh. Well, there's still a lot of uneducated people out there about silica. Yeah. You know, county county highways blasting sidewalks with silica blowing all over the tracks. Yes. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, maybe a t-shirt tied over her face. <laughs> Well, that's how Maybe. he used to do it. <laughs> oh, boy. I played a lot of golf ball like that, and it shows sometimes. Just ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> they were cutting brick at my daughter's school when she was younger in the city, and I went down and was screaming at them, and the building inspector thought I was a crazy person. But I said, you know, this is – she's 28 now, so she was four. She talked wow. 20 years ago, and I was yes. saying, don't you know that's silica? And they're like, I said, where's your wet method? You have a hose here. You don't use it. The building inspector was not happy with me. You know, I was blackballed. I was down there screaming. But what it was is they're doing out behind, and all the windows are open in the kindergarten class, and the, all the sills were full of dust. I was screaming. And they thought I was just some crazy woman, didn't know what I was talking about. But I was doing OSHA at the time, you know, training for um, first year apprentice instructor. And we had OSHA class in there. And they just started talking about it. And they thought I was a crazy woman. So I'd be standing out with my arms folded saying, okay, where is the hoses? And they, here comes that lady again. But they used it. It wasn't just protecting the kids. It was crazy. Right. It was all first kindergarten kids. And it was the people that were working in the site. It was a college they were building. It was crazy. I didn't have all kind of knowledge, but I knew it wasn't good. You know, I was just learning myself, you know.
All right, so welcome back everybody. Looks like we may have a couple groups still in session. Uh, waiting for everybody to, to pop back up. Hey Joe Tarakowski, how you doing? Good, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, but you at home? I'm in Oakland the, uh, for the week, um, but yeah, I've been in Las Vegas home for, since right after March. There, please back up. All right, so we're all back in session. Um, wow. So Phil, I will let you take it away again. Okay. Hey, hey I think it. Uh, I think that if every group went as successful as the group that I was in, uh, then this was a really good exercise. Um, I heard a lot of discussion um, about how the, this particular application could be used not only in, in OSHA training, but also was specific to uh, apprenticeship training. And uh, I can't remember if it was Joe um, who threw it out there. Uh, forgive me if I give the wrong accolade to the wrong person, uh, but um, they saw a real potential to create plans that they knew would not work uh, mm -hmm. so that the apprentice could identify yeah, that was what was wrong with these plans to create ones that will work. Um, and I wanna open the floor a little bit uh, per group uh, just to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to, to um, Tell me what they thought um, of, of this particular exercise and how it could be utilized in your home centers. Thanks for the credit, Phil, but he's lying. He did everything for us guys. We just sat back and watched him. <laughs> no, we were kind of thinking just making a false uh, account up or um, uh, record or whatever you want to call that, that form that we did, making a false one up with, with a lot of mistakes in it and having the apprentices or students pick, pick them out with the flaws and what could be changed and different. Yeah, I love the idea. Love it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that myself. Uh, Veronica, your take on it? No, I like the idea. I never even thought about that. So that is actually a pretty cool idea. Uh, we we did a a, a plan um, just using drywall and painting. Um, and I have seen the form before, but I never really went through the whole thing. And I, I like that it's, it's actually pretty easy to follow. Um, and I like the fact that you can print it and save it. Yeah, I, we, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I really like the uh, exercise. So I am thinking to utilize it. Yeah, I, 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 I really like the, the, the involvement with the student because they get to control the plan. It really gets them engaged in thinking about the activities on the piece a plan needs to be created for. Um, you know, and then, um, you know, our activity was actually we were replacing a portion of concrete. So we were actually going to cut the section of the sidewalk out. Um, so in our, in our first part of our plan, um, they, the guys had come up with, okay, this is what we're doing. We're going to use a saw that has a water attachment on it. Uh, and then our second application, um, we're going to be doing this and we're going to have to wear respirators. And the minimum requirement to be able to perform that activity was to know what an APF was and to make sure that they've had a minimum of OSHA 10 to perform that task. I thought it was really good. I hope everybody thought the same. Um, just get a few more comments uh, in. Um, anybody else have an opinion of the plan? Hey, Phil, I, th I think, you know, just to add to what everybody else is saying, you know, that our group talked about the apprenticeship also using it in an apprenticeship, making plans for you know, the different tasks that they're doing throughout the day and having the apprentices actually do the plans. I like uh, Tarakowski's actually uh, view on making some mistakes on there because if we teach everybody the perfect way to do something and when they make a mistake, they don't know how to correct that mistake, right? Mm -hmm. So I think knowing how to correct mistakes are important. I mean, that's how we've got through a lot of times is being able to understand how to fix something, right? Because exactly. mistakes happen. So I, I, I like that that idea there 
but the, the plan in itself, uh, CPWR does really, really great work that goes into a consensus of the building trade. So all the building trades have a, have a, a view on, on what goes into those plans. And, you know, um, just, just remember that how easy that plan is. There's so many other stuff on CPWR. That's a huge tool for not just us as instructors, but it, our, uh, our apprentices going through and our, our leaders that come back for OSHA classes. So I just wanted to make that comment, Phil. Yep, no, I appreciate that. Um, I would love if I could pick on Spencer a little bit to have him weigh in on this particular resource, uh, especially with work safely with silica and, and about it that I may have not brought to the surface. That was, that was Spencer. no, Spencer's on here, but his video's off. He might have stepped away from his computer, Phil. I don't oh, know, okay. but I'm just assuming yeah. that. Okay. But then when he comes back, Phil, you got to make sure that's the rules. He has to be on video at all times. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> because, oh, we, we may need to bump them off now. Hey, Phil, do they have this for something other than silica where you could develop a plan? They do. They just develop. This is Ken. I sat on the committee for CPWR. So they just actually came out with a COVID-19 plan also because you have to have a work plan for COVID-19 on the job site that was just released. So that tool is out there also. And there's some few other ones that are that are on there. I uh, believe they also have construction solutions, which is uh, more of the uh, uh, physical hazards as well, too. Yeah, there, uh, CPWR, in, in my opinion, is probably an, uh, an underutilized resource for some really great tools. And, and that's something that I wanted to emphasize is, you know, go to the website, look around, see what they have. There's, there's a lot of good tools just like this one. There's so many different directions and things you can do uh, with a tool like this. As you guys saw, every time you click one of the, the little bubbles, there's more questions. And then there's, there's more possible ways to do this. Um, it can open up opportunities for people to see uh, potential solutions that they didn't even know existed. Um, there's, there's so many different ways you can do it. Um, and the only thing we did run into, and, and I will say this, and it come up in our group as well. Um, let's say David Arvio, he comes up with a excellent plan and I want to utilize that plan. Um, or recreate that plan or show it. Uh, his plan is saved under his login information, but what he can do is he can email me that plan and I can walk through under my credentials and recreate that exact same plan so that I can utilize it again. Um, for, for me, I, I like uh, trying to make sure that each person in the room uh, let's say I've got a pretty good mixed group of drywall finishers, painters, and glazers, and maybe a hydroblaster or two all mixed into my OSHA 30. Um, I want to represent every single trade. So I might run through three or four different plans or break them into groups just like we did uh, based on their trade and create a plan. But it's also good to use diversity there, make them create a plan for a different trade because it's really easy for me as a painter to complain about the electricians on the job, but I don't always know everything that they have to deal with. Uh, it's just easy for me to complain. So switch those groups, give them a plan to create for another trade. It's a great way to exercise this tool. Another thing you might think about, um, you know, I, I always was trying to integrate the, the, um, you know the union side with the training side at our in our in our uh, district council, and um, encouraging where there was where areas where we could train uh, business reps as they interact with contractors to make the the contractor's experience as a union contractor more valuable. And if our if our business reps are familiar with this site, uh, then you know when they interact with uh, contractors that are interested in or need to need to do a silica plan it could just be another another way to um, to uh, you know to help them 
to get their, their to be compliant so the, the members are, are safe, but, but also to, uh, to avoid you know, citations and, and just to see a, a way to, to handle the silica issues safely and, and easily. So just a thought. Yeah, good. Um, you know, know, I can make a comment as well too. Please, please. Uh, another resource might be manufacturers like uh, USG, they might have exposure assessment uh, data that might show uh, where uh, they're actually located at. I've seen some for uh, plus three and I've seen a couple other ones. And those products are well below the um, actual level. The ones that I've seen, they typically vary for the uh, uh, quick set, anywhere from six to eight micrograms for uh, a cubic meter. Yeah. So if you have that documentation, I think the key is if you stay below the actual level, then you keep doing what you're doing now without uh, doing a whole bunch of major modifications. But you gotta have the documentation and um, manufacturers might have a lot of that. Same as the uh, tool manufacturers, material manufacturers as well. Yeah, a lot of that information, like you said, the data is already there. We just have to go find it. Um, I, I know that with, you know, with this particular tool, um, the only thing that I would say is to open up a second dialog box, like you said, to find out what the common uh, uh, exposures are to the use of that tool, to find out if maybe one activity should require two different actions uh, under the same activity. Uh, for example, I'm gonna use water, but I'm also gonna use a respirator with a, with a HEPA cartridge. Now, a lot of good commentary, a lot of good questions. Um, I might be a little bit early. I think we're a couple minutes till lunch. Uh, so uh, unless anybody has any questions, I'll turn it back over to, to Kevin uh, and to um, Nicole and they can take us to lunch. Thanks, Phil. No, that's a great exercise and, a, and has a very well done job. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take a quick lunch and then we're gonna come back and Dave's gonna, gonna lead us in the next segment. So we will, uh, we will be just 30 minutes if we can. We've got alternative training methods with Dave coming up next, and then we're going to close things up with MOOC today. If all's good, you guys uh, see you back here at noon or whatever, 30 minutes. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you got to be technical with the apprentices because they always split hairs. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we'll see you guys. You're the boss. Not the boss. I'm a co-instructor. That's what we're, we're dealing with here. Of instructors, and that's awesome. Uh, that gets your goat every time. I think maybe he's doing that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, and it's, it's kind of, it always amazed me. You know, you hear somebody, uh, you know, we teach all the time, have been instructors all the time. You think of Nolan Ryan, who has who's had over 5,000 strikeouts, and yet he would say that every time before a game, he would be nervous until he towed the rubber. And, and you know, I, it's the same way in this. Uh, Any time that we are instructing, especially whenever we're a, asked to lead a class of our co-instructors, it could be a little, make you a little nervous before you get into it. And, and even though everybody's always gracious and nice, Everybody's always great to work with. Uh, it's it still does. No, we're good. Uh, really, Dave. Any time that you want to start, I, I think we're we're good to start. Or have we got? Let me we see. We had everybody back. We're missing two: okay. uh, Ernest and Todd. But I think okay. we should probably get started. So. Yeah, I think so too. Yep. How did I get back? <laughs> uh. <laughs> I've been saying for a long time, Ernest. At the bottom left of your screen, look at that. Uh, there you are, brother. You are back. Yeah, but all I've got is Zoom on my screen. If like you... uh, Spencer said, look at the bottom of your screen, looking for that camera, point it to the right, click on it, it should pop all your windows back up. I see a camera, I click on it. It's still, I've got y'all's picture. I'm showing Kevin and then all of us. My apologies. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go over. He needs to go up. We're gonna up go and over.
view speaker yeah, on the right hand side it will say view speaker and you can see everybody mm -hmm. just and not just the person who's talking yeah where's it at there may top right hand corner it'll say put your mouse over there say speaker view and it will change how many people you can see mm -hmm. like or gallery view. view right it gallery view. Gallery. yep you want to click and then on. we're getting awesome, yeah, awesome tip <laughs> We're going to be going over that all see. those settings tomorrow. So we're going to be doing uh, Zoom tomorrow at uh, uh, let's see, see. I at got the a star. Says bookmark this tab. I got a little man, current user, but I don't see anything that says view. Hey, Corky, do you want to FaceTime with me, and I'll help get you going? <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're gonna. That's that a whole other question. How do you no. face me? All right, Phil. Appreciate that. Yep. You're welcome. All right, so we're gonna get going. Uh, we left off yesterday. We we're talking about the online training, and then Kevin uh, talked a lot about the online training as well. I'm gonna build from that, uh, Spencer. I got news for you. Uh, it wasn't your hey. website that was screwed up yesterday. It was Bitdefender, so it wasn't my my app. Uh, it was the antivirus crap they got here at work, so that was blocking it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So it was your it was in house at, at your center the antivirus. Yes, that was oh. blocking it. So that was the second time that it happened. Uh, so now I completely removed it. Then uh, I tried uh, the smart mark. It, everything works fine now. So okay, that's good. what uh, was stripping me up yesterday. But we're good to go. All right, so I'm going to start sharing one screen, um, and then we're going to go from there. I'm just going to remind uh, remind you that you have, and then I'll show you where you can get it. But you should have the information that we're going to be going over. And now you should see what I'm looking at, right? Can everybody see that screen? Yes. Okay, so in here, um, if anybody's what taking my class. It's kind of yeah. blurry, yeah. Yeah, you see it? It's not readable. You cannot read it, though. It's better now. Better. Oh, you're talking about how the uh, size of it? Yeah, okay, so let me. I thought you were not getting the, uh, the information, the page. All right, so better? Perfect. All right, from now, uh, from here, we're going to do a little activity. Um, it's going to do, by show of hands, let me blow up my screen that I have over here so I can see everybody. Show of hands, uh, who is using the only device they have to connect, whether that's a phone or a tablet? <clears throat> Anybody using just one device? Joe, do you got just the one? You got your phone on the side or no? Anybody have uh, their phone? Because what I, I want you to do. I got a phone and I'm on my computer. Okay, so you're going to need your phone. Do me a favor. And I hope nobody has a flip phone, right? We still find them every now and then, but <clears throat> what we're going to do, uh, I want you to do a Google search, so I'm going to lead you by this. So okay. if you have an Apple uh, phone, you're going to use Safari. If you have an Android phone, you're going to use uh, Chrome. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to type in um, construction CFR, and this is a Google search. For me, I'm doing it on the computer. I'm going to blow this up. And in there, <coughs> close to the top, you should see something that says .gov. That's where you're going to go. Regulations. So the first one that I get, since I look it up so often for me on a regular basis, you want to open this up with your phone. So if you use an Apple uh, iPhone, use Safari. If you're using uh, Android or uh, Samsung, use Android uh, or use uh, Chrome if you have it. So now when you click on it, it's going to take you to a page that looks like this. There you go, Joe. Looks good. All right. So how many, if you uh, have an iPhone, you scroll down a little bit and then up, you see, should see at the bottom of your screen, you should see an arrow pointing up. Click on it, and then you scroll scroll around, either up or down, and you're going to look for Send to Home Screen. 
I don't see no arrow. See it. <clears throat> if you have iPhone, this is the way it works. If you have Android, uh, just give me a minute and I'll finish up with the iPhone. I'm on the people. iPhone. So if you have a uh, my browser, it's Google. So I just followed your lead right there. No, you gotta you, you gotta use Safari. Open up Safari, and then do a search in the uh, search the address bar. Search for the uh, same thing you just searched. I know I'm young, but what is Safari? I, I hit my internet and it goes to Google. <laughs> At the bottom, the uh, default, uh, the default browser for an iPhone at Safari. The one that comes with the iPhone, not something you put in there. When you click on that. Um, that arrow at the bottom of the screen, then you're gonna send to home screen. So basically when you uh, close that app, or when you close that browser, when you look at your home screen, probably the last uh, screen that you have, you're gonna see that link. So now you have access to that on your phone, and when you open it up, all you have to do is tap it, and it's gonna behave like an app. It's always up to date, it corrects directly to uh, OSHA, so you don't have to uh, remember to carry anything other than that. Um, so for the Android people, same website, Chrome, top right of your screen, you should have three dots. Click on it. Do the same thing. Look for send to home screen. So when you do that, you can, before you close that, um, name that whatever you want. Typically, I name mine 29 CFR 1926. For you, you can name it whatever you want. The reason why I like showing this, especially with this format, is when you're training your own students, this is pretty handy. And we're just about to start talking about the online alternative uh, training and all that. So this might play into uh, people wanting to find out more information about what you're teaching, and then they can look this up. If you add, have students taking the class, it might be competent. Yeah, go ahead. Add to home screen? Yes. That's pretty cool. I like it. <laughs> And then if you look at my screen over here, the screen I'm sharing, if you click on the left, uh, if you look at my left tab over here by, by industry, you can also do that as well too. By standard number. If you look at this over here, now I went back and it gives me everything. So for me, I wanna have everything. So I'm looking at part 24, procedures for handling retaliation complaints, part 70. You could do the same thing with this uh, thing. So if you're a health and safety trainer, this is very useful because you can find just about anything, any regulation that we abide by other than state or local regulations that might be, uh, uh, might be uh, related to you, you know, depending where you're at. So that is pretty neat. You can do the same thing for 1910. The same thing I just walk you through. You can do the same thing if you do, uh, if you do any work that is regulated under 29 CFR 1910. Any questions on that? I just wanted to show that um, before I get started. Make sense? All right, so now that's gonna be like an app. You never have to update that. It's always gonna work. It's always gonna connect back to, uh, to OSHA. So that's a good deal. And so let me get back out of that one. This one, regulations. Okay, so I'm gonna close this window. And the next window that I want to go to, everybody see what I'm looking at? Federal registers. So this is basically what I have over here. I already say, uh, have it saved. So for me, I saved all my, uh, my website that I visit on a regular basis as a favorite. And I organize that by folders. That helps me. That helps me find. So in this particular case, I created a one folder yeah, for OSHA 502. This particular class we're doing now. I looked for the links and then I went and looked them, looked them up, and that's how I, I've been doing my training. So the next one, somebody mentioned yesterday, uh, I looked up Duarte in here, couldn't find him. I looked up uh, Schwagler, I couldn't find him. Looked up Arvaio, couldn't find him. Uh, Harnard, I, I couldn't find either. I didn't know about Phil, but he still, uh, he made, uh, he's clear. So this is the one that somebody mentioned yesterday. When you go in, you don't want to be on this trainer uh, watch list. So this is the one. And then this is where the little trick that I had uh, yesterday, control F and type the name that you're looking for. But if you go through, it gives you the uh, list of people, whether they're suspended or revoked. And then you definitely don't want to get on this list. So this is the one that I forget who mentioned it yesterday, but I wanted to show that as well too. 
this one, we're going to talk about um, video conferencing. Is that the same thing as uh, online training? Can somebody give me a yes or no? Video conferencing. No, it is, it is not. And you got two different things there, David. Different guidelines. So as what's well. the difference, Ken, if you could tell us? So what we're looking at right now is uh, this is the authorized online training providers. There's only eight. So unless you're on it, you're not an online trainer. So this is the one, um, the one that OSHA authorizes to do online training. Yeah, like the, I, the, IU, that, uses, yes, the IU uses Red Vector, which is on there. Yes, it's on the LMS. Yeah, you can uh, get through it. Uh, by going to the LMS, but I believe they have to buy into it. Um, I don't remember exactly for OSHA, but they also have other classes. They have scaffold classes, silk classes, uh, uh, ASCOM, I believe as well too. The one that we uh, sometimes we use here for people that need the class right now, right here, right now, we don't have one scheduled and they need it to get on the job site. It's click safety. That's the one typically that we use. We haven't had any issues with it, but those are the authorized. Uh, centers. So the the online. And then finally, uh, David, yeah. that, that the online is uh, if you. I mean, I'm sure most everybody's looked at it. I mean, there it's a it's like a PowerPoint. You click through it. You watch videos. It's it's all automated. Video conferencing is what we're doing now on Zoom. Yep. We're in person sort of in person you actually look at somebody in the eyeballs if they're looking in the camera anyways <laughs> and um mm -hmm. and you have interaction and you have the ability to ask questions and uh, so so that's the big difference between what they consider online and video conferencing one is self-guided, the other one, one uh, facilitator and instructor. Uh, and that's the one that we're going to go over uh, the rules and guidelines that apply to that kind of training. I just want to specify so that it, yeah, go ahead, Ken. And the census in the building trades, the census is, is that they prefer face-to-face -face training and be in that this video conferencing get us as close as we can to be in face-to-face -face with the interaction is acceptable, even though we would, rather be in a classroom, the online training personally and the census for the building trades is basically using this in that emergency situation where you have to get somebody some type of knowledge to get them past. But we were rather shy away from the online classes because it's like Spencer said, it's a PowerPoint and anybody could really take it if they're in the room. And not only that, uh, the topics don't necessarily pertain to our trades. So you might take a, a painter, might be taking an OSHA 30 online, and you have to go through excavation, demolition, and all the other stuff that we never do. Uh, instead of spending more time on rust barriers, fall protection, and the stuff that it's pertinent to what we do. Uh, so that is uh, 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 the biggest difference is that the one, you have somebody leading the class, and like Spencer uh, said, you have question and answer. Um, you have the interaction that OSHA wants to see when we're doing uh, the training that, that we're doing right now. So this is, um, this by the way, this is basically uh, the guidelines. Um, so I'm looking at, I'm on OSHA.gov slash training outreach. Um, so if you scroll down on that, let me minimize that a little bit so I can get more stuff on the screen. Actually, it's not letting me, but here, when you get down over here, this is where you find your, your information. So if it's a worker looking for that, you have that information as well. Outreach trainer watch list, how to get a replacement card. And then this is the one that we're gonna be going over. So program uh, requirements, what I'm just about to uh, start diving into, this is where you find it. And then I'm just gonna touch briefly on this one so that you can see what topics, how that pertains to uh, what you do. So does anybody have any questions before I open up my document? This is where you would get a copy if you don't have one. This is where you have to go every year and get your own copy. And uh, on that, I'd just like to mention that this is the first year since I remember training, since I've been a trainer, that OSHA has not updated this in 2020 in one year. But obviously this is not a typical year. So I would assume they're being affected the same as all of us. So 
the guidelines that we still have are from 2019. So let me stop sharing this screen and I'm gonna to go to my screen when I have all my notes. So they um, actually, DTE, who is the, the arm of, of OSHA that handles all of the outreach training programs, um, they have instituted a policy now that they will um, only make changes uh, other than just you know typos and what have you they'll they'll only make changes at the beginning of the year so uh so you can just sort of anticipate unless there is something that that is earth shattering a change in a in a standard or something like that that requires them to make the change in the middle of the year they will they will only make policy changes at the at the beginning they'll they'll announce them like in october and they'll make them in January. So that is that is correct. Typically they announce in January and they go into full effect in April. So typically, yeah, that's a timeline. So let's see, everybody can see my document now, right? So this is the one. So like I said before, this is the one that Kevin was going over yesterday. Uh, same outreach uh, guidelines, effective April 1st, 2019 till now and uh, probably for next few months uh, as well too. So in here, as a training tool, we're talking about the uh, uh, delivering training in a different format. What I'm using right now is kind of useful. I like it. It's Adobe Acrobat Pro. Um, so this is one of the one that's got a lot of tools that you can use. And as I'm showing you some of the stuff that we're going over, I'm gonna be showing you what you could do uh, with it. So on the left side, I already went through my document and I have a list of menus. So instead of scrolling down endlessly, I already bookmarked the spots that I want to hit. Uh, so if I hit my first one, um, let's see, takes me to a spot that I want to be at. So this is very nice and useful. So on this one, I just wanted to reemphasize how long is um, your authorization good for? The 502, when do you have to retake it? Uh, five or four years, what is it? Four years. So every four years, so you gotta make sure that you're always up to date with that one. Don't let that uh, lapse. So if I go to the next point that I wanted to make, this one, all the, uh, when you, we're gonna start talking about the, uh, the video conferencing. So we're talking about all the guidelines that are gonna be in full effect. We're gonna talk about some of the differences, some of the exceptions, because um, whenever OSHA comes out with something, they might have an exception. And that's what we're going to be looking at when it comes down to in-person training as well, too. So uh, all the training requirements are in full effect. So how, how many minutes? How many classes? So, and I you think. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Joe. How many classes do you have to teach minimum a year to be current? Uh, Spencer could probably address that one a little bit better. You, you don't have to teach any. Uh, class, any number of classes to to continue to maintain your your uh, authorization. Okay, we were under the assumption you had to teach one or two classes a year to stay current. No, it used to be. I mean, years ago they had that, but then they dropped that. Um, so uh, all you need to do is keep up with your uh, your authorization every four years. Um, However, uh, a lot of internationals are, you know, they're looking closely at the investment of time and energy that they put into authorizing people, right? And if they're not doing any classes, then why are they reauthorizing them? <laughs> so, uh, so I would encourage you to, um, to take advantage of the effort that the international is making to provide classes like this and make sure that you do do these classes for your membership because that's a commitment at Ken you might want to jump in here I mean it's a commitment the international has to make sure the members are trained so absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah if you're not if you're not training and and you're you're, you're not putting out the effort then why go up to Hanover and, you know, take your 510, your 500s or your 502s and, uh, and all that stuff. We really want trainers to, to take this training. So they go back and train the members. That's the whole purpose behind this. 
is is to do that i mean just because you want a, a 500 card just to have it you know say that i have a 500 then you're not doing what it it's intended for and the intention is is getting every single solitary member within the IUPAT trained in safety. Okay, so I can only speak to uh, what we do here, um, going along with what Spencer said. We, I'm responsible for my training center to uh, schedule instructor for classes. And what I do, I rotate it around so that nobody gets rusty and we all teach, we all help out. So all the instructors that we have in my training center, we're all authorized to teach um, and then we spread it around. Typically, what I like to do too, on a personal note, is uh, if somebody's not necessarily comfortable um, with a certain topic, like a glazer taking respiratory, I like to pair them up with the uh, the industrial person or somebody who's got experience, so they can walk them through. Um, so that is uh, how I handle that, what we handle here in our training center. But uh, Spencer answered it better than I could on their side, on their end of it. All right. So statement of compliance, you got to fill that out, and once you actually um, once you actually qualify uh, under CPWR, their guidelines, then you're authorized to teach that. But keep in mind that the document you're going to sign, you're basically stating that you're going to follow the rules and you're going to play by, by the rules that uh, are stated in this document. So this, this, uh, this one's kind of particular uh, important to me. Um, when you look hey, at... David, yeah. can, I, can I just yeah. throw in my, another two cents worth here? I would yep. really encourage everybody, if you haven't taken time to read this document yourself, I would really encourage you to read it and, and the accompanying one, the construction procedures. When I first started, I, I, I never read any of the requirements documents when I was a part-time instructor. I, I, I didn't, you know, I just took the class, went home, and I was thankful that the secretary knew who, where to send the paperwork and what to do. Things are way different now. And you, as the trainer, are the one that's responsible, not the international, not your training director. You, as the trainer, are responsible to make sure it's, you're following the rules. So I would uh, encourage everybody to take time with a with a, uh, with a highlighter and read through these. And if there's anything you don't understand or any process or procedure that you think your, your training center is not doing what that's supposed to be doing, then ask the question, you know, why aren't we doing it this way? It may be that you're misunderstanding it, but it may be that everybody's just assumed that everybody knows what they're doing and there's somebody that doesn't and you're, you're the one that's on the hook for it, so. Just a word to the wise. I agree, Spencer. Thank you. Yeah, and then uh, on top of that too, especially with the uh, with the construction uh, one, that's how you're going to build your your courses. They're going to submit, so you need to be able to uh, deliver the training that you say that you're doing. But when you go to submit those records, they also need to be compliant. You need to have the uh, required time, uh, mandatory uh, topics, and all that. So you you got to make sure that you hit all of those. The one thing, um, and I don't know how. Uh, can everybody read this or is it small on your screen? What I'm pointing to right now, that first highlighted text. Do you see it? Can you read it? It's, it's in there. Readable. When I read that, it's small. Okay, so when I read that, yeah, okay, so I can't blow it up a whole lot because I'm going to lose a lot of my tools, but you have access to this document. But the one, uh, one thing that jumps out at me, it says in proper class setting, and they're giving you examples of what that would be. So this includes holding training at a place not conducive to learning, for example, providing training in bars, private residences, or locations with outside distractions. So as they're clearly uh, stating it, when people are taking that course from home, they're gonna have a lot of distractions. They might think it's optional. They're not gonna be following along at all now. So that it, they, it, it is your responsibility to make sure that the training gets delivered and the students are getting something out of it because we're gonna talk about a variation about testing when we talk about video conferencing. Training under uh, training delivery, uh, training does not comply with the requirements listed below, will not be recognized and trainers will not be issued students course, course completion cards. That could create a lot of problems. Uh, your contractors uh, send people in and then they don't get the cards because of something we did wrong, it might create an issue uh, with a whole bunch of people. 
the number one on that list, uh, if we look at the students that we have in this, uh, this course, uh, this class, we have uh, two instructors that are taking the class themselves. So technically a student or an instructor cannot be a student and instructor at the same time. So either one or the other one, not both. And it's clearly stated right there. And then uh, Kevin talked about the difference between the course and the class. Uh, they also go into that a little bit. Uh, like I said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about what uh, Kevin already covered. So we jump right to page eight of that document. And then in there it says about class style. OSHA expects outreach training, uh, training to meet the adult learning needs and include interactive activities. So this could be a challenge. And um, as you're seeing here with Zoom, we've tried a couple of different approaches. They had uh, polling, Kevin was using polling. Um, uh, Phil used breakout sessions. I plan to use both tomorrow in the one segment that I'm doing. Um, so you could do a combination off, but it is impossible to build a scaffold to actually get the hands-on assembling or disassembling the equipment or actually for them to use it and all that. So it might have certain limitations. Uh, so it needs to be hands-on activities, involves student participation and interaction. The other point that I wanted to make as we look at uh, the next page, um, when he talks about language, Zoom does have the ability to assign one person to translate for somebody else. But then uh, you create, the, you have that problem, how do you verify um, the accuracy of that and is that, that other person doing the translating? what's happening to their training. So we go back to kind of like the uh, translator that uh, Kevin was talking about and maybe potentially added to the time. So this one over here, like I said, uh, Zoom does have that functionality that somebody could be doing the closed captioning for somebody else, but it's gotta be real time and they might have our time keeping up. So I started getting into uh, interpreted, uh, interpreter qualifications Daily student signing sheets. So that's also gonna be an issue as you can see, or not an issue, but it's also gonna be required. As you can see, uh, Spencer has been keep, keeping track of that. So there are different ways of doing it uh, when it comes down to taking attendance. Typically, um, like when we went to, when the pandemic started, we went to online training ourselves uh, for three months. And when we were doing online training, what we would do, we would have uh, the students text their name on the chat um, field several times, first thing in the morning, uh, after a break, after lunch, and then before they, uh, before they sign off. So we, and then we print out those records, we record the session so we have the people to attend so that we have documentation on who attended. So that is one way of doing it. The other way would be, and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, is that in Zoom, like in this course, you are given a link and before you can actually take this course or the class, you had to register. That's uh, taking the attendance portion of it because now you can print that at the end. It would show when, uh, who was on and when they were on and off and all that. So you have that at the, uh, at the back end where it keeps the records for you. So this is a uh, uh, number three that's highlighted as well too, detailed topic outline. So you definitely want to know, and then we're going to take a quick look at it at the end but you definitely want to know that at the end and uh, or be, you definitely want to know that ahead of time so that we can structure the class so that you can submit the records and it's all, uh, it all uh, looks and is it operates, works the way it's meant to um, with the guidelines and everything else. So at the end, I'm going to show you a template that I created that um, what I use to keep track of our training and to simplify scheduling and new classes and all that. So uh, records, submissions. So I believe Phil is going to go over the, uh, the outreach portal where somebody is, um, and then you're going to see how to submit the records and how, how they, this whole thing that we're going to be talking about plays into it. Um, Kevin talked about minimum class size. Uh, there is that minimum class size, and I think Job Corps people brought up that if you had day one, if you had one person uh, show up or not one people, let's say day three started the class, and day two, only two show up, then you go back to this minimum class size. And then you might have to explain that to a CPO you are because you need a minimum of three students per class and a maximum of 40. And then obviously the records you keep for five years. 
So the uh, detailed topic outline, we we'll talk about that. Certified and then uh, this uh, highlight portion that I have, it says the OSHA outreach training program is not a certification program, right? What does OSHA certify? I'm an authorized trainer. We do, uh, we issue certificates of completion. We don't issue uh, uh, certificates or we don't certify the students that take the classes, take their courses. Alternative training methods, this is where we're gonna spend a little more time. So let me scroll up or so that I can see more. So OSHA required that all training is in person, right? But they also have exceptions and that's what we're gonna talk about. So in this case, it says under alternative training methods, uh, this is page 19, uh, if you had your book or if you had your copy, so alternative training methods, OSHA outreach training program classes must be conducted in person unless written exception is obtained from OSHA or the trainer's ATO as described in section uh, 5C above. So what's gonna be your ATO? Anybody know what their ATO is gonna be or what is currently your ATO? What is that? What do they mean by that? Authorized training organization, which right now is uh, <clears throat> for most of you on the, the phone here is CPWR. Me and Adolf right now, since we're getting our card switches, Dominguez Hills in California. So we have two different ones here, but we're going to be switching our cards back over to CPWR. Yeah, thanks again. So the CPWR, uh, NRC, National Resource Center which is uh, the authorized uh, training uh, organization that you guys are gonna be submitting your record under. And then online training, OSHA outreach training program authorized training may not, may not conduct online uh, OSHA outreach training classes. And then we went into the uh, authorized online training. So it's not us, it's the authorized trainer, the A company that we saw. And then we can start looking at video conferencing so under that, it says OSHA's preferred delivery method is through standard in-person classroom instruction. So it's a lot more effective. We can show what they could do. Um, it's more participatory. But then again, just because we do a Zoom class or a remote class does not mean that OSHA says, okay, so you just talk, you do a lecture and they listen and that's it. No, they still got to get involved. We're going to take a look at a couple of things that OSHA says about that uh, coming up. So OSHA outreach training program, training conducted through a remote site video conferencing or other live interactive instruction that is not stand, standard in-person classroom instruction is not allowed unless OSHA or a relevant ATO has granted a written exception for the conducting of such training. An exception for video conference, uh, video conferencing request must be submitted in writing by the OSHA outreach training program authorized trainer to the relevant address indicated in section 4A and must be received by the ATO at least 60 calendar days in advance of the scheduled training start date. Exceptions may be authorized um, for a designated time period, not to exceed, exceed 12 consecutive months. The written requests must be submitted to a primary trainer's ATO and include the following. So this is the, uh, you make the request, to CPWR NRC if you wanted to um, ask for that accept, exemption. And in order to get that, you need a detailed narrative statement indicating why the trainer believes an exception is necessary and explaining why the inherent flexibility of the OSHA outreach uh, training program is insufficient to deliver quality training. So right now, if the state mandates that you cannot have more than five people or more than 10 people inside a building, that might be sufficient enough, right? Spencer, you got a comment? I see you. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it is completely uh, legit. And uh, uh, so if, if COVID uh, has caused you to need to do this, um, they've even waived the 60 day uh, requirement. So if you need to put on a class, all you gotta do is, uh, what is it a through i just uh, and it doesn't have to be super complicated it's real simple stuff just send that uh send that information in an email to mike Casman, and he will uh he's doing 
dozens and dozens of these all the time, uh, these approvals. So um, if you want to put on a 10 or a 30 using uh, Zoom, just get this info to him and he will, he'll give you the thumbs up and get you going. Hey Spencer, I had a question about that. Obviously you're serving as a proctor now and I know they, uh, they address that. Would you need to assign a proctor from CPWR for that training to take place? No. Or no, no. 15 or 30? No, no, but no, CPWR doesn't need to, it's only for the, the numbered classes like 500, 502, 511, 510, whatever, you know, that they, that they need to have a, uh, uh, a CPWR person on, on, the, on the class. <clears throat> and I have a question for you, Spencer, for us, we do, we take the attendance through the chat so we can print that out. And then we also have a recording of the class. Would that be sufficient record keeping for attendance purposes for the class? You know, I, I, uh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm, I'm guessing it would be okay. Um, you know, we go the extra mile and, and it's expensive to use Adobe, but, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, I think, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. So if you want to check with Mike, he, if, if you have any issues, um, just check in with Mike and he'll, he'll get you the answer on that. Anybody else, uh, anybody else have any questions on, on any of that stuff that uh, Spencer just talked about? Would anybody consider doing an OSHA, oh, uh, like a, a video conference, OSHA 10 or OSHA 30? Absolutely. Is we're, that something you would do? Is that we're working that out right now through uh, DC 16. Um, they got a lot of members, I mean a lot. Uh, probably 25 a week that we probably need to get through just so they can hold employment here. Uh, California rules and regulations are pretty strict. So um, the the members will not be able to be employed unless we get them through a program. So it's something we have to do, even though we believe in the, the face-to-face in classroom, you know, that type of training, we also have to look at, you know, that we have to get our employees to work in the safest way we can. And I know some cities like New York, I believe you gotta you gotta have an OSHA training card in order to work, right? Certain cities have that requirement as well, too. The state of Nevada is the same, David. Uh, Adolf, how how long before they? There's a certain time limit too, right? They start work, they have to have that OSHA card in their hand by I think what is it, 15 days. Yes, sir. They have uh, about the 30 day, but 15 within their hands and stuff, but. Uh, with that said, again, OSHA is like pretty much uh, the guidelines where you start because here, what I'm getting at that, not that I'm putting OSHA down because that's some beautiful laws. That's why a lot of us are alive. But uh, the contractor also has the option of uh, asking you to have it prior to and in cases, uh, that's, been, that's been the issue here that the contractor actually wants it prior to getting out there. We also have it in our master agreement, a few cards that our members need to be before they're able to be dispatched, which includes scaffold, hands-on, the Overton, uh, the mobile area work platforms, one of the OSHA cards and a respirator, or they can't even get a dispatch. Kevin, you have a question. I think Joe, oh, I see you raise your hand, but Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and take Joe first. Uh, Joe, go Joe. Ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. When I came into training, um, some of the old instructors told me you can write a letter to their contractor with your instruct instructor number saying that they completed the course. Is that legal or can that be still be done? Um, I know it's, that I've done it a couple of times in the past. I uh, haven't done it, you know, recently, but, you know, when people are saying, oh, I need the card, you know, tomorrow we did the OSHA 30 or something over the weekend. I need the card tomorrow to get in the plant. So, uh, you know, some of the old instructors said they would just type up a letter uh, saying to whom it concerns, yada, 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 finish the OSHA class, you know, and, and my, you know, your instructor number and all that. Is that legal to do? Is so what that, what, 
what that is, Terry Gossi, is that you got they got 90 days to actually get that card in a participant's hands. And sometimes at some point, the contractors uh, needed to know that they went through the course, that they completed the course, that they did the course, and they weren't going to get their cards for that 90 day period because it's 30, it's 30, 30, and 30, right? I have 30 days to get it into the the the, the uh, uh, ATO, and they got 30 days to get it into the uh, OSHA. I think that's how it works. And then, you know, the 30 days to get it back in a participant's hand. So it was that lead way that the contractors were worried about because they could not prove at any point without a letter or something showing that they took the class. What we do about that, Joe, is here, we do the same thing, but that's up to the GC or whoever's was asking for that to take that. Um, we tell the apprentices or take the, or the members that mention to the uh, whoever was asking for that letter that you just waited for the car, you completed the training. But the other recommendation I can make on that is the IUPAT app, it's a great tool and as long as your training center is updating the records uh, with Veronica, we completed OSHA 30 on a Saturday. She uploads the record by Monday and by Tuesday, uh, the member can have those and directly from the app, he can send that to the employer as well too. So that is a great tool uh, that it comes from the IU. It doesn't come from the member. So it has a little more credibility uh, on the member's behalf. So that might be sufficient as well too. And where is that and how do you do that? The IUPAT app. Um, it's oh, got training cool. records, it's got the pension information for the locals to contribute, but uh, that would be up to a training center to upload the records to the LMS, and you would have to contact the IFTI for that if your training center is not doing it, but most likely they're already doing it. Mm -hmm. So whatever they upload, um, it's, it's going to be that's a, on that app. That's a great idea, but let's be honest, ain't none of us on time with that stuff. So would a letter be sufficient enough that I print and give to them? As far as OSHA go. goes, the letter is okay. Yeah, four o'clock right. Sunday afternoon, and they need it. They need it at the gate of that of that uh, you know power plant at, at six thirty a.m. A letter in hand is that sufficient enough? As, as far as OSHA is concerned, a, a letter is recommended. Okay, they, I mean OSHA recommends that, and do it on your your JTC letterhead. Mm -hmm. So so um, you know they know. It's more that, efficient. And, and, you know, again, again this is something that, uh, you know, the employer group should, since all of them need this, they, they should, through your LMCI, you sh you, all the employers should inform one another that this is what the JTC is doing. Your training director should let everybody know. When we do a 10 or a 30, this is how we're going to let you know that this student has completed. That way, every, all the employers know that this is something that's not just coming from an instructor who sat down and wrote down on, on, you know, on, a, on a scrap of paper, you know, yeah. Joe was in this class, I, you know, I, and this is an official notification and everybody is, is uh, on the same page and, I, and I, it'll, it'll work. Right. Yeah, we so, normally do that. We have the letterhead of the school and all the information, and we give them the letter the last day of the class after they took the whole course, and, and it's just so they can prove that they did the class until they receive the uh, the actual card. Uh, I mean, like you guys said, some people may take it, some some places won't, but. Um, that's what we're we see, do. Today. We're seeing it all over the board over here, uh, Joe. Some some contractors take it. Some contractors want to see the actual card. Um, so, but it is uh, legit. So that's some uh, temporary. As long as they have a good explanation, and like Veronica mm -hmm. said, company letterhead helps a lot uh, too. Yeah. So it's not just a hand, uh, handwritten note by uh, Joe. Well, it's I mean, I have a copy of it on my computer right now. I just put in the paper that has our letterhead and, and ribbon on it. I put that in the yeah. printer, so it makes it all kind of look, looking more official, but. I just want to make sure I wasn't doing something illegal to where I could lose my instructor status or anything like that. Yeah. No, as long as you're doing everything else uh, by the book, I have, if you're following all the uh, guidelines, you're good. All right. All right so if we look at over, over here at this uh, the document, um, it's got all basically all the same requirements for the uh, normal training that we do. The one portion that I highlighted, it also includes or it adds to the normal requirements. Um, the experience delivering occupational safety and health training via uh, video conferencing. So what kind of experience does the person have? So in there that specifically asked 
uh, ask that you provide that documentation um, as well when you're asking for that exception. So um, in there, type of software, hardware that you're gonna use, location, um, the location of the uh, training center. This one kind of threw me off a little bit um, because of the, uh, it says list of the uh, offsite training locations and then students must receive training in a classroom, auditorium or conference room setting. So obviously we're talking about the same thing with the pandemic. So that's the one that I uh, had a note on. Uh, states and local government or municipalities might place limitations like the state of Illinois for us uh, when the pandemic started. It went from 50 following CDC guidelines, it went down to 10. So when they hit 10, we had to shut down the school and go to the online, um, to the online uh, training uh, when we had to. Uh, primary training authorized trainer must ensure that a proctor is present. So this is the one that I was asking about uh, to uh, Spencer. So proctor, uh, you would spell it out in there. List of the materials that will be provided to each student included in the description of when and how students will receive materials. So this is where I'm gonna uh, pitch the, uh, the IFTI, the LMS. Uh, if you upload, if you have the course materials and all that, that is kind of like your uh, blackboard. That's where the student can get the materials. That's how they get access to the uh, syllabi. They get uh, the training, whether that's a PowerPoint, that's a handout or whatever. You make it, if you make it accessible that way, that might work. That's how they can access whatever material they need. Description. So David. Yeah, go ahead. David, um, we don't need a, a, a CPWR person to proctor but you, you, this, this regulation does require that the instructor have somebody that helps them with the paperwork and making sure that everybody is, is online when you're doing a video conferencing. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. It actually helps out a lot when we were doing the uh, online HASCOMs and all that, typically we're doing two men teams, the one person training and the other person taking attendance and also operating the controls. If there was a glitch, if somebody was having issues, so we have a, a class coming up, we're gonna do it remotely. I'll be operating the controls on the back end, setting up the meeting and all that for, uh, for the class. But then one of my uh, co-instructors, he's gonna be delivering the course because he's a lot more comfortable doing that. He's not that comfortable with the uh, technology. So I got, I'm gonna be operating the controls on that one. Uh, list of materials, uh, IFTI, DLMS, description of how the primary ocean instructor uh, authorized trainer will ensure that the introduction to OSHA uh, module will be conducted in a participatory manner. So in here, there's thrown out that it's got to be two-way communication. So the uh, the student needs to have access to the instructors if they have any questions. But it also, to me, it tells me activities, handouts. OSHA uh, requires that we provide a handout for the topics that we teach, regardless. Anyway, so. That was, it's just spelled out right there. And then the, uh, at the end, this is the, uh, the one uh, key. Since you're doing it remotely, OSHA requires testing at the end. How does that play into with contact hours that uh, Kevin was talking about? So an OSHA 30 might be what? You add, you can't take the testing as part of the time. It's like the breaks, you 86 it out of your total hours. So total contact time, Adolf, is uh, how many hours per day? I'm sorry, contact can you? Hours. Total seven contact and hours. Seven and a half. Seven and a half. Yes. So that's the other variable that I wanted to mention too. If you think about somebody sitting for seven and a half hours to try to get done an OSHA 30 in four days or an OSHA 10 in two days, that might, might be kind of tough. Exactly what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. You might have to go show shorter days in order to make, uh, make sure that it's a it's an efficient class it's an effective class david i have a question for you you mentioned something about uh i think it was on uh, do, 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 the lms to getting the materials i do believe that uh -huh. one did. yeah that's what you were saying uh uh for i right for the lms to use the lms is that for uh, j yeah j for list j. the material the yeah, the requirement says list of the materials that will be provided for each student, including a description of when and how students yeah. will receive the materials. So yeah. if you're uploading those materials, they're available at the uh, LMS. It's just as simple as having our learning management system. That's where they connect and they, 
the access to material that way. Correct. So correct. they made this to that requirement. Yep. Correct. Thank you. I just wanted to verify which one you were talking about. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. The next one that I have, uh, like I said, testing. And then um, besides testing, they have three requirements. The first one, student satisfaction survey for content and delivery, including summary narratives for uh, each. Second one is going to be the testing. And the third one, follow-up impact evaluation. So this is right there in writing. So when you do an OSHA, an OSHA 30 in person, there's not necessarily a, a testing requirement. You can have activities, or if you do testing, that's got to add to your total time, your contact hours. So these uh, have to take place. Does anybody have any question on those? Question or comments? All right, so for that is specifically dealing with Video conferencing, um, not to be confused, like I said before, with online training, which is typically self-paced and typically done, uh, like Spencer said, uh, with a PowerPoint, through a PowerPoint, um, that way, it's set up that way. Does anybody have any questions about this document so I can show you the last thing that I wanted to show you? Any questions on the document? On the document? Actually, let me go to the next one over here. So in here, this is basically, I'm just going to quickly take a look at the OSHA training. This is the uh, by the way, this is the construction. This is how you build the program. So these are the two documents that Spencer was talking about. So this particular one, it gives you the rules on how to build what's required. So if you're doing OSHA 10, if you're doing OSHA 10s, we're looking at the requirements right over here. So you need to spend at least four hours on the Focus 4. So in there, uh, you need to spend a minimum of one and a half hours on falls. Electrocution struck by, caught in between. Um, the minimum topic length for those is half hour, but you can structure it the way you need to. You can emphasize the areas you want and not overemphasize the areas you don't. And then it gives you uh, different topics. So when you get to the OSHA 30, it actually gives you elective topics as well, mandatory and elective and then optional. Uh, they give you two hours to play with in the OSHA 10. But when you're talking about the OSHA 30, mandatory curriculum 14 hours so when you submit your records and you're trying to upload how many hours you spend on, on your classes if their numbers are not within what they're uh, listing over here the system is not going to take those records so mandatory introduction to OSHA is one used to be two some years ago they brought it back down to one then they added some years ago managing safety and health minimum two hours and then on this one uh, on OSHA 10, for Focus 4, you need at least four hours. For an OSHA 30, you need at least six hours um, in there. Minimum half hour topic as well. Uh, same thing as hour and a half, minimum for falls. We typically do a lot more. I think we do three or four hours, four hours, I believe, on falls, three hours in the respirators under PPE. And then um, you have the Focus 4. I actually, we talked about those. Uh, does anybody remember? TO and uh, EO, what does that stand for? Because when you do your training, those are the object, ob objectives that you have to meet. What does TO stand for? Terminal objectives. Terminal object objectives. So basically, can the student recognize the hazard? And then EO, do they know where, where uh, the hazard is um, and what it looks like? So EO would be, can they protect against it? So enabling objective. So as long as when you're doing your training, that's something that's gotta be in the back of your mind. Am I teaching the students how to recognize the hazard or am I teaching how to read the standard book? When you're doing your OSHA 10s or OSHA 10 or OSHA 30s, they're not supposed to be standard based. And then it gives you electives. You need 12 hours of that and you can mix and match whatever you need. And they also give you um, the optional ta uh, topics for four hours, whatever you want to incorporate that pertains to worker safety and all that. Anybody have any questions on that? Then this is what you need to have access to. And I showed you how to go get it. And it should be been part. If you got a student manual, it should be there. If you had a digital copy of it, it should be there as well. Um, so you can, you can find it easily. And the last thing that I'm going to sh uh, share with you and then I'm done is how I make sure that 
when I submit records. Can everybody see what I'm looking at? So I created a template with all my topics for, uh, for the OSHA 30 classes. So under new, and then I go into personal, I already have my personal templates that I created. If I scroll down, I'm gonna be looking for my OSHA 30 uh, class. So I have two, one for apprentices that we use with structure that we use with apprentices, and one to, that I use for everybody else. So in here, let me blow that up a little bit and then I'll shut up, I promise. I'm almost done. So in here, I have, we teach up for, uh, OSHA 30 in four days. Uh, I don't wanna cut it to Kevin's uh, time, uh, he needs time, so. So what I do here with this sheet, I can print it out, but this is how I assign the instructors to the classes. So I can uh, I keep track of the days that were known classes. And then also I break that down by day and blocks. So in here on the left side, for my personal reference, I have the minimum requirement that OSHA requires. And then I go over here. This is the topic that we're covering. This is the time that we're actually spending and this is the instructor assigned to that. If I have any special notes, and the way I, the reason why I like using Excel is because I can set up my times, it calculates everything for me. So this is what the uh, outreach portal is gonna be doing. It's gonna be looking for exact hours. So if I modify my any of my numbers, so if you keep an eye on this and this, so I'm gonna change that to a two hour, that you're gonna see what happens to my total for the day. So I don't wanna calculate any of that so I don't screw it up. So for me, I created this document and instead of saving it as a spreadsheet, I saved it as a template. And every time I'm gonna do a class, I just go back in, open this document, put in the information I need to put in, save the document, and I typically save it as a PDF and then distribute it to the other instructor so everybody knows when uh, and what they're teaching. Does every, anybody have any questions? All right, uh, Kevin, it's all yours. Thanks, Dave. Oh, no, that's that's Sorry, really cool guys. on that spreadsheet. It looks like a great tool. Um, we're going to get into the ANSI standards. Phil and Dave both done excellent jobs today. Appreciate uh, everything that you guys do. As far as we had mentioned to our Job Corps instructors, and you guys have my admiration for sure. It's a, and, and Veronica was talking about going through the program. That's awesome, man. I didn't know that either. Um, if you guys, I don't know, I know that some of you probably went through the ANSI with us. So what I'm going to try to do, instead of trying to rush through that material in the course of an hour, you could do it. You can navigate it. But I don't want to be just kind of speeding through things. I'd rather talk to instructors and talk about, actually presenting the material if at all possible. So I'm gonna share screens real quick. And okay. I believe everybody could see this, right? Yes, sir, so far. Thank you very much. Now, is this the same thing that uh, we talked about, Kev? This is, yeah, this is. I'm not going to go over everything slide by slide because, like I said, a lot of people have, and it's going to be really pressed in time. So I'm also going to look at the layout of the class uh, in addition to what we've got here. But please don't, don't hesitate to ask any questions. What I did last night was I broke this down into three segments. So I got Module 1 as a separate segment, Module 2 and Module 3, and I put them in PDF format, and I thought maybe we could break out into three different groups. And I, I broke down the questions that pertain to those sections. And I was going to let you guys uh, find the answers within those modules. Uh, I wanted to, to take the ANSI standards themselves and share them with everybody and then have them look up the, the information. But with the copyright uh, with the copyright issues and everything on that, I didn't, I didn't ask for permission to do that. And I didn't, I didn't pay for um, a copy or a subscription. So I, I bought it so that I could I could take it and then try to come up with a training program off of it. So I'm, I'm not at liberty to use those. So not at this time anyways. So basically, this is designed as just a supplement. We had the ANSI A92 standards 
It's actually it's dot, uh, 22 and also 24, safe use and training. And um, those went into effect on June 1st of this year. They were supposed to go into effect earlier, like so many other standards, they got blocked, they, they got uh, delayed. Uh, whenever they finally went into effect, what that means is they're not incorporated by OSHA. So they're not incorporated into the OSHA standards, but they are recognized standards. And being recognized standards, uh, then, and just like we had talked about earlier with the general duty clause, that's been brought up a couple of times in this, we could actually find our, or the contractor could find themselves in trouble because they're not training or keeping their employee as safe as they possibly could because they're not adhering to the newest, most recommended standards. And this is a recognized body and a well-respected one. Ken's got to do a lot of work with them and, and with uh, a lot of the agencies. So has Spencer, that's awesome. We've got a lot of great, great resources within, within our IUPAT. Kevin? Yeah. The ANSI committee, which is the A10 committee. Yes. Been, uh, it's probably the longest running committee. It started in 1944. There's, wow. Uh, 75 approved voting members uh, on that particular committee. About over 200 show up for the meetings, but there's 75 approved voting members. That's, that, that's information I didn't know. So, again, we got great resources within our our uh, organization for sure. So in that, this is set up, it's got a very small description up front, uh, then it goes into module one, module two, and module three. This is just kind of telling us what we're gonna cover in that, learn about the changes in the operation and maintenance of scissor and boom lifts on job sites. This standard pertains to more than just scissors and booms. But we concentrated on them because that's what most of us use out in the job site. So it will also help the participant recognize potential risk factors in our work environment. So it's, it's more focused on the risks than even though we may cite some of the, the standards themselves, it's more focused on the risks. So now um, anybody that's, that's known of them of anything in the past, whether they're mobile elevated work platforms, or uh, even called by any other name that they have in the past. They're now referred to as MOOPs, uh, which is the, Mel the Mobile Elevated Work Platform is what that stands for. They might have been called self-propelled in the past. Um, there are a number of names. And then whenever you get into geographical areas or even areas that are dominated by manufacturer, you can find them like a lull. You know, people call all-terrain uh, all-terrain forks, you know, lulls a lot of times instead of, uh, that's a manufacturer, much like drywall and instead of gypsum board, you know, USG made drywall. So there are different types of moops, but we concentrated on the scissors and the boom. Um, we just went over some of the major changes that are required in the manufacturing. We also described the benefits of implementing some of those changes how to identify and describe the maintenance related problems. Since we did a class or two on this, I did have an instructor reach out. He was kind of concerned because of uh, they had a local lift provider that had delivered some lifts to their training facility. And he, he just asked what is required of them because the delivery person had never heard of the A92. And, you know, that's, that's going to be something that, that is, as far as the training of their employees, going to be on that particular company. Uh, we're not responsible for that, obviously. But one of the things to note, whenever you're looking at any of these standards, is that rental houses are also considered dealers. So anytime that we look at any of these standards or anything, and we see the term dealer, that also is reflective of rental houses or those, you know, might be um, United, United Rentals or, or Sunbelt or any of those. So also another thing to keep in mind is the hierarchical structure of the standards in place. And it puts the emphasis first on the design, which isn't far off from anything else that we've de dealt with, because that's engineering, right? 
So the design standard is the lead, followed by the safe use, and then the training standards. And, and what they mean by the safe use and the training standards is, first off, the design standard will require the manufacturer to provide operations manuals. Also, the safe use standard will require that those manuals be maintained and on the machine and that users read and understand them prior to use. Then you have the training standard that comes in. It's not that any of them are less important than the other, but we do have that hierarchical uh, direction. So the MOOP owner, as I mentioned earlier, they are gonna be responsible to train all the delivery drivers, everybody that works for them in, in this. As far as for us, if we're renting them, a MOOP user uh, must be able, and uh, well, the MOOP renter must be able and willing to familiarize the recipient of the MOOP with its functions if requested, and must either provide training or must advise the recipient on where to obtain training for themselves and their employees. So uh, the, some of the things that the owner has to have on that lift whenever they, they provide it is uh, they must ensure that all prop, that it's all properly safely documented. They should have some type of visible, either um, some type of visible record somewhere on the body of that lift that we could see the inspection dates and who performed the inspections, that they're signed off by that individual. Should have all the manuals, all the safety bulletins, all the safety features should be working, you know, as, as uh, they should be. There shouldn't be anything that, that isn't working whenever it comes to lights or any kind of audible alarms. Now we've got also wind alarms and, and uh, other types of alarms that have been added for extra safety. Of course, if it's gonna be used outside, uh, now the standards require foam filled tires or solid tires. They can't be, can't be air, so they can't be pneumatic. That's just some of the things on, on the rental houses. But I'm going to drop back into this. So if we see this is broke down, we got module one is a user and operator. So this kind of goes over what some of the users and operators are, are, what their responsibilities are, who they are. We do have a definition for an occupant now. That's any individual physically on the platform, but not in control of its movements. Naturally, we're going to know what a user is, right? And though the occupant is not in control of the movements of a MOOP, they must still be trained in the safe use of MOOPs, and it is the responsibility of operator, supervisor, and the employer to know that they're properly trained. So then it goes over some of the supervisor's responsibilities. We have a, a supervisor now within these standards. The supervisor has to also know and perform any, uh, know all of the standards um, know the correct answers, know how to do a risk assessment, uh, not only know how to do it, but provide it. The user and the, and the, the uh, supervisor should be able to do that. Naturally, the, the occupant wouldn't have to perform that. The supervisor has to, to know everything and go through all of that training. They do not have to do the hands-on portion. So if there is a, a foreman or a supervisor that's listed on the job site that hasn't gone through the hands-on portion, they have to be adequately trained on all the other aspects of it. And a big part of that is a selection of what type of MOOP is going to be best for that. Consider access, preparation, maintenance of the site to include an assessment that the support surface is adequate. We've all been on job sites, I'm sure, where somebody has built a, a little job-made ramp and uh, the tires have busted through the plywood, all of that kind of stuff uh, we've seen. Uh, we got to perform a risk, a site risk assessment, ensure that the MOOP is maintenanced properly, all the inspections, make sure it's going to be, uh, the inspections that are going to be performed on the job site too while we have it, or have an agreement with the rental agency that these are going to be provided and who's going to do that and when they're going to do it. So we can't, uh, we do, whenever we rent these things, I don't know how many of you have, have ever signed off for a lift on a job site and how many read the documentation. And this is prior to these, these uh, standards, but 
how many of us have ever read it and not just put our name on it, accepted it, and went about our work? A lot of it. I mean, I didn't either. One time, uh, just I had to wait for the delivery of it, and I read it. And those documents that we're signing back then, even prior to this, absolved the rental agency of anything, whether it was a malfunction of the machine, maintenance, anything and everything. So in that paragraph, in that segment, what I started doing is X and through it, put my initials on it, and I never had them not deliver a lift, but, uh, but I, always, I always X that out. Now, I mean, we are assuming that whenever we're a user, whenever we're renting it, or whenever we own it. So those are, uh, we are we're, we're assuming that responsibility that all of that's gonna be taken care of first. I'm gonna drop out of this real quick, and I wanna go over the layout of the class. Sorry for hopping around on that. Um, right, um, here we go, we'll look at the outline. You all should have access to this. If you don't, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I need to go on to uh, the IFTI, uh, into the LMS, and, and see what all has been uploaded, but I believe all of this has been uploaded into this folder, and it's gonna be FTI 1148. So uh, whenever you're looking for it, you should be able to download the material from there. If you can't, let me know, and, and uh, I'll get it, get it over to you in a zip file or something, or a zip folder. But basically, this is gonna be contingent. This is designed as a supplement. So what we've got is those that have had recent training and initial that is full. So they've done the full training, they've done the hands-on, everything else. This is a supplement to be able to bring them up to the new standards of the ANSI. So and this is about how much time and estimate. It's gonna depend on your questions in your class. It's also gonna depend on, on uh, how big your class is. Obviously, it could increase the amount of questions. So pretty much 10 to 15 minutes on module one. If you've already, if you tack this on to an initial, say if you got six hours of training that you're doing on an initial and you wanna add this on the tail end so that they're, and, and, and make your own one day initial training, that's, that's perfectly fine to do. So if you're using another format, an Overton or, or another, another preferred trading, your own in-house, you wanna tack this on for the ANSI. Uh, at the end of the day, you could do that on an initial. I'm gonna try to, uh, to find, I'm gonna try to, to take the time to create a new initial. I know for us, uh, and anybody will be welcome to, to have access to it too, if I do that, uh, as with anything. It's a great thing about training. I love, I love how everybody's always willing to share their hard work and, and, and share with, with all our other training centers. It's, uh, we, are, we are one. We're part of the IEPAT and that's, that's awesome. So if we can take something and if you can ever, anything I ever share to you, if you can modify it and make it better, that is awesome. Um, please share it back if you would, because <laughs> I'd like to benefit from it too, right? So each of these segments are gonna be about 10 to 15 minutes to go through on the modules. You got maybe a five to a 10 minute on the intro, maybe, uh, allowing the students to intro themselves. Again, that's gonna depend on the size of the class. There is a built-in at the very tail end, there is a built-in segment that is the review questions. You can go over that as a class, especially with COVID um, and the, the challenges we got right now. And not put out a paper form. There's also tests in this folder that's got their paper tests. They got 25 questions. They're the same that are the review at the end. If you're going to give it as a test on the tail end, you may not want to go through the full review with your class because they're the identical questions. I would suggest uh, grading it to 100%. It'd be if, if you are, uh, and that's just where anything that they miss, you go over it with them and have them initial it. Uh, and, and sign off on the fact that you went over it with them beside it. Because, uh, you know, we, a lot of the passing, just like in this, it may be 70%, but 
But that 30% is pretty important. And if they don't know what the correct answer is, then they could find themselves in trouble, uh, not even knowing what, what one of the answers might be. So in general, we're not talking about a lot of the hands-on. The hands-on, there are two handouts on this, if you could see. And uh, those handouts are going to be later. But in the handouts, if you do go out, Phil, I know that Phil does this for sure, but he has the apprentices bring up a risk assessment. And whenever they, they perform a risk assessment and try to figure out, you know, even how they're getting the equipment from where it's stored to where they're going to work on it, the tasks at hand, all of these things, uh, looking at one of the handouts, and I'll try to bring that up real quick. Uh, I don't want to close that. I'm going to cancel that. All right, handout one. This is on how to perform a site risk assessment. And it, it breaks it down pretty simple. I, I think JLG, I believe, was actually the one that came out with this. It's, all, it's the same one that I see that Overton has used in their coursework, too. Uh, but this... We want to define the work. So in that, what kind of tasks are we doing? What, where's the location at? You know, uh, what about the support? Is it going to support the equipment, the machine? Is there any other hazards that may exist? What kind of timing? When does the need work to be, the work need to be finished? Are there times that you can't work in that area? All those are things to consider in defining the work. Um, select the move. That's going to be another part of that. We want to make sure that that MOOP is, is going to be the best one that we can use, not just one that we can make work or modify. We want to make sure that we have evaluated the risks. What height are we working? What's the rated capacities? Are there any kind of uh, power lines, anything specific to avoid? Also, uh, additional is keeping workers on the ground safe because that's also our responsibility. Even though they're not part of our team or part of our task, we still can't put them in jeopardy when we're performing our work. Identifying the controls, that would include uh, any kind of safe work procedures, using the correct PPE, ensuring understanding of fall rest of systems. So, we have to make sure that the occupants understand all of that too whenever it comes to PPE, fall arrest systems, where to put their anchors, um, how to lower the equipment in case of an emergency. They don't have to be trained on everything, but they, but they have to know that how their tasks that they're going to do are going to make the machine unstable um, or the move unstable. They got to know how they're going to get it down if anything happens. Proper training for operators, occupants, supervisors, and maintenance personnel. Smart scheduling. Ways to minimize any kind of exposures. Rescue plan is a must. It's got to be written. It may include uh, a second MOOP that, if one's available, but we also want to limit the amount of time for suspension trauma. We want to make sure that communication is great. The operator's trained and authorized to operate it. The occupant has a basic knowledge. The supervisor monitors the use, ensures the safety plan is followed up. The technician performs all the maintenance. So that's, that's kind of the breakdown on that. Has anybody got uh, any questions at this point? I thought I saw a couple of, maybe I didn't, on the chat. Yeah, nobody, Kevin, nobody this, is Adolf. Had, yeah. this is Adolf. Uh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, let me just unmute. I had my hand up in a gutty okay. Okay, Sorry, it brother. To myself. Now, no. what you're uh, saying on this right here, especially the supervisor and responsibility on the people uh, knowing about the safety and everything without yes. getting too much in it, because it, this accident just happened at a Legion at the Raider Stadium. But this is absolutely true. I don't, I can't stress enough how you can, uh, I don't know, heed warning to the, our members, any one of our members, especially the foreman's on now. And then this is just not a conversation and not to you know, point fingers or do that, oh, you, you. But they should get in, any, any of the supervisors, foremen, and everybody should come in because sometimes, at least in this area, they're not so willing to come in for the class and send everybody in to do the class. But with this accident at the Elysian, a lot of people are being interviewed, everybody down, every foreman, 
everybody on the rescue, everybody that had to do anything that had the authority to move that, that uh, boom. It was uh, a 180 that came down at Elysian. I know you guys can uh, look it up. It was one of our painters, real good friend of mine, known him for years, worked by him. Kieford is his name, Caceres. He's pretty much put it out there. I, I don't know if there might even be an article on it, but what really came down without getting in, into details of where OSHA is looking at to the people that attempted to rescue him had no clue what they were doing. And that's actually what caused the accident was the rescue part of it. All those wow. people, from my, my understanding, are lawyer, they're having to get lawyers just because of this new stuff and all the emphasis it puts on to everybody that has the authority to move it or anything of that nature, which came down to, I don't believe any of them had any kind of formal training. Uh, Adolf, thanks for sharing that. Uh, there's a classic example. And I'm not sure, but Ken had sent me a picture of a, of a lift. Uh, and it looked like, looked like it may even been a 180. I didn't, I didn't see the details or the numbers on it, but um, he had sent me a picture of a, of a boom accident. I was wondering if that was it. I don't know what he sent you, but I do. Oh, I'm sorry, Ken. No, go ahead. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I don't know which ones he sent, but I do have the ones from there. Uh, so it was pretty devastating. Our members pretty much Did out you? of it. Okay. Just the small things uh, that I do and I can mention is that that lift had been out of service the day before. They put it back into service saying that they had fixed it. What it really came down to where it kind of the problem initiated was every command on the basket that he did or, you know, to make it go up, boom, or whatever, no matter what he did, it would only boom out. So it got him higher and higher and higher. So they try to do the same thing on the ground controls. And the only one, they would extend them. And the only one that would bring them down is if they brought uh, the boom straight down without bringing in, uh, without retracting first. Wow. Obviously, anybody that's done hoisting and rigging or fulcrum points, that starts to shift right away. Sure. You, you know, what's really just... bad is OSHA didn't contact anybody at the training center. Nobody. No. Wow. Uh, so that's a different, yeah, yeah, and that. So anyways, yeah, what I was getting to is this right here, as far as, uh, you know, letting them know that they can be in a lot of trouble. From my understanding, it's going to be civil and criminal. And and I think that that's kind of the direction that, that everything's going, isn't it? I mean, especially, I mean, uh, civil lawsuits, uh, the, the typically they're just, they're sprinkled out. Uh, everywhere, and then it's it's just kind of see where it goes. Watch so those any loopholes. You know what I teach you guys taught with me, me and the loopholes. I really hate them, but yeah. there's there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, there is, there is no doubt. Thanks, Adolf. Appreciate it, brother. No worries. The there there that is a classic example, and and something else in in the implications of that. Right now, we all are dealing with COVID, uh, and and we're going to hit on that as a recordable too, but uh, can't emphasize enough. We all should have that, that written COVID policy and we should all be adhering to it very strictly. So just like this, uh, you know, we, we can't come at this half-hearted because, uh, and, and there's a classic example, not only can somebody get hurt or killed, but we could be liable and, and get caught up in civil lawsuits too. So we wanna make sure that we, where policies are put in place and written that we are adhering to them and that we're following them for sure. So this, this is a great exercise. If you wanted to take this, have your apprentices or your members create some type of a, a, a job risk assessment. That's great. And, and what I did for a situation where maybe we don't have that kind of time, uh, where maybe we're working with uh, journey people out, journey persons out in the field and other things. I, I know that if something is out there that's that's kind of fill in the blank, it might be a reminder on there for them to check on this. You know, there might be a topic that they may have forgot about or so it serves more than one purpose. What we've got is uh, threw together a handout two on this. And what that is, is a it's, a, it's a site risk assessment. 
So this kind of, if we fill this out, we should hit most of the things that we're going to run into that could be a problem. Kind of gives it in a simpler format that, that we, could, we could check on these. It also is a, is a simple reminder that, hey, I need to look at this. I almost forgot that. It, and like everything else, too, well, it's got a place for the user's name, the supervisor's name, the dates. Uh, and it's got areas to where you could kind of fill in something that's not there. If there's if there's any other risks or anything that any concerns, you could Kevin, add. Yeah. Are you showing this on your screen? It or should no? be. No, we yeah. we're st we're stuck on PowerPoint slide nine. I'm sorry, brother. Let me hit the old stop share. Well, that's a bummer because I've been sharing a couple of things. Sorry about that. No, no problem. I just caught that I, myself. Thank you. And then, then uh, Dana put a, a a question in there and thought the same thing. There you go. We got it. Now. All right. So now you've got. Thanks. Here I am thinking everybody's seeing what I'm seeing. I apologize. No, that was uh, actually Dana actually woke me up with a comment on in the chat. To well, say. thanks. I appreciate it. So here's a. As we can see here, the things that we're going to we're going to kind of need to have on there manufacturer model type group. We've got job site name, name of risk assessor, today's date. We've got what type of work, um, what type of move, you know, where will the work be performed? Just the questions that are that are generally off of that first handout. This is a way to kind of double check to make sure that we're going through those steps. And we also have a generic if there's areas, uh, what, just a general areas where we could fill in, if there's any additional risks that, that are present on that site, how we're addressing it, little place on the end for the user's name, the supervisor's name. So um, this, this also brings another level of responsibility like Adolph was talking about, uh, about the seriousness of it. You know, and if we're, throwing our name on something, hopefully we're, we're also, not that we wouldn't anyways, but hopefully we're taking it a little more serious that, that the steps have been performed properly. Anybody have any questions on this particular? Nope, everybody's good. All righty, let me uh, see if I can't. I don't know if it's possible for See if I can put a couple of things in this chat area real quick. I don't know if our time is going to allow for it. All right, group one. I think I have a question here to get kind of up to date on this whole deal with the ANSI. Uh huh. So, what happens? Um, you know, they got a lot of upgrades or a few upgrades, anyways, um, re re changes. If our scissor lift or your contractor scissor lift doesn't have a gate system, I mean, is that is that got to be con completely, you know, thrown away, or is there some kind of modification or grace period there or something? There's a lot of modifications that are going to be done by manufacturers and uh, you know, use owners rather. If it's manufactured after the act, the the start date of the enforcement of those, then it's going to have to have a gate on it for sure. Um, it's going to be naturally uh, advised if it can, but no, they're not going to. It's not disposable. It's like every other standard, uh, just like whenever some things, as long as it was following the manufacturer's recommendations of, of that particular time. If that manufacturer comes up with anything different, uh, then and and makes any advice. For instance, and I, I'll give you, a, here's, here's something else too. The owner or dealer must ensure that they have all proper safety documentation for the MOOP, including manuals and safety bulletins. Finally, the owner dealer must ensure that the MOOP is registered with the manufacturer and must be able to receive any safety related bulletins and manufacturer sends out related to the MOOP. So they, the, the best process would be to contact that manufacturer. Also, uh, just kind of like whenever you get a recall on your, on your Chevy Impala, your 2006 Chevy Impala, 
then then uh, any time that there's any kind of modifications or anything to that move, the manufacturer can contact you directly. So um, that should be something that's done by the rental agencies, uh, that which is going to be considered what the the owner, right, or dealer, uh, and and also by our company-owned equipment. So any of the equipment that we have, we should be notifying the manufacturer and getting those updates, uh, getting anything, because we all know that there are always special exceptions or provisions for a manufacturer's suggested use uh, if, if, if it's in mom, right? The manufacturer's recommended or, or the, the operating manual, the manufacturer's operating manual, then you might be able to get some variances on scaffolding on the, on the steps, on the, the differences in, the, in, in how far apart they are, all of those things. If it's within the manufacturer's guidelines, then then we do have that protection also. Does that help out at all? The one thing for sure that we want to check for, if any of them's brought out to our facilities, we want to make sure that we can visibly see the inspection date. And that should be something that we're going through with our students too, having them find all that stuff, look for all of that. Um, I know that that way too often, uh, the maintenance hasn't been performed in the past and, and I've seen and we've all used lifts that we shouldn't have been on because they, they either they had no brakes or whatever have you. We got all kinds of stories on all that, right? You know, um, has anybody, any question on anything else that we've, we've covered so far? So I'm going to try yeah, I was, to... I was just curious because like I said, you know, we, we talked earlier at, at, at break yeah, and I have a class uh, tonight, and you know our lift is, I don't know, 15 years old, so it still has the chain gate on it. Yes. Um, so you know I don't know I, I, we're out of compliance there. Uh, um, I, I, I would reach out to the manufacturer uh, and and try to get it registered with them uh, for any updates on that particular model. Uh, you, uh, it's from everything I see, there's no problem with you using that lift, as it is. Uh, we, we are also we're also in the same boat here. Yeah, ours is old, and it, it, it's that's not its only problem. So we're we're kind of hoping we can get an updated one soon. Yeah. Um, well, no, that's that's a that's a great great reason for sure. Ken, was you gonna say something? No, I was just gonna tell Tarakowski he he's okay right at, right at this point. I would like you said they'll get that just a documentation from the manufacturer. So you have it in documentation in a folder someplace. That way you can show that you did do your due diligence and check on with the manufacturer to make sure that it was okay. But as for now, from the time that prior to that ANSI standard, he's, he's, he's okay for that. Thank you. Hey, thank you. This is one of the things I had done last night. I threw us into groups, three different groups for breakouts. Uh, it's kind of what I had, had planned on doing. There was a, I made a rookie mistake. It's the first time I ever did this one. I've done a lot of mistakes, but it's the first time I ever, I ever particularly done this. I, I like to create, I cheat a lot whenever I'm doing different uh, forms or different Word documents. You know, I'll, I'll use the same one and I'll put save as and I'll change the name. And, and I'll use basically, you know, all the same form, just change the wording on everything. Well, I, I did that in creation of these three documents last night, and it's the first time it's ever happened. But I didn't know that, this, that the, the uh, automatic save was on. So what I had was three documents of the same thing this morning, whenever I got in here. And I checked that, and I was going to email it out to everyone, and it's like, so I, I, I was scurrying before the class to try to get the other ones put up, but just a warning, just make sure the auto save isn't on on anything. If you do the same thing, because it'll change everything on that document too. So it's, uh, it's, it's one of the things that we could, we could do. It's kind of like whatever Joe was talking about earlier, whenever we are sharing uh, or giving information, it's one of the things that we like to do with a, a safety data sheet. We got an old MSDS that's got the 16 sections. They're all properly in the right right order, everything else. But it's an older, it's actually from 2012. 
And we like to utilize that in, in our hazard communication class because uh, we like for students to catch that. We like for them to catch at the age. We like, we like to be caught in, in those situations. It still has everything, still meets today's criteria. It's called a material safety data sheet. But, you know, it's good to, to do that kind of stuff sometimes. Um, it actually, and it's a little bit off of this, but, man, my, my career almost lasted like six months. And, and just, just flat out, because I came primarily out of the drywall field. Uh, it's what I've, I've been most of my, you know, I've done commercial residential painting, but nothing, nothing industrial. And I was asked to, uh, to lead, actually to do a fall protection class for a industrial shop, uh, our uh, a Thomas shop actually. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to be as a drywall instructor in my eyes. I'm going to be going over fall protection that these guys know in and out that I haven't used most of it, uh, and and I'm supposed to be teaching them. And the pressures that can be there are, are immense, obviously. And nobody wants to look like they're totally clueless. Uh, and, and so I had cut a deal with the, with the DOT, and I said, uh, yeah, I'll do the class. Do me a favor. Uh, I'll do all the classroom portion, but whatever it comes to the hands-on, if you would, you know, I'll, I, I would like for you to be there, and we could go over the equipment. And uh, anyways, he said, yeah, sure, absolutely, give me a call. So I, it was in a different building. Finish the class, give him a call, no answer. We're on break because we're, we're done with the class. Give him another call voicemail give him another call you know all this is during the break no answer it's like dang it you know it's to the point where i was almost to the point of going hey guys uh i gotta get something out of my truck you know and just keep driving because <laughs> i thought the last thing i want to do is, is is uh you know be in this situation but bob Lattimore, who many of you know uh, he was the industrial instructor the day before, he had been in our hands-on section, and he had had all of his apprentice put up all the safety equipment. So uh, I, I looked around, and I, I told the class, I said, look, look, guys, we're going to do this a little different today. I said, what I want you to do is I want you to work in groups, and I put them in groups. I said, I want you to go around here. I want you to check out all of this equipment. I want to know what looks like it's done correctly, what doesn't, and I want to know the reason why. And we're going to look it up uh, on, on all the answers. And, man, they dug in. Uh, I, I mean, they were happy as heck to go about it in this way. And the class went well for the rest of the day because it's always uh, interesting to, to try to find mistakes that others made, right? So, and, and, and that was – so it got me through. So I'm, I, I'm here today, but I it's – certainly understand what it's like uh, a lot of times to be in areas that aren't out that are kind of outside our expertise it also many times will make us good in those areas because we'll put devote so much time to them and we haven't uh, we haven't developed bad habits or unacceptable habits in those fields too so it can be it can be an advantage if you want to really learn something have somebody teach it right if, if, if we are doing teach backs and you guys are given a segment that you don't, you don't, you're, you've never been around and you got no idea, you're going to, you're going to dig into it pretty hard and you're going to learn it pretty well. Um, we talked about doing segments or teach backs in this. Uh, it would have been nice. It is optional in the 502. I know that uh, the, well, CPWR is doing a lot of teach backs in their 502s. But, uh, and, and even with the numbers that we've got here, so it, it would have been possible. You wouldn't have had to suffer with me as much. That would have been a plus. But uh, I'm going to show, I tried to put those in the chat room, but it says I've got them open because I wanted to share them on, on the words, on the Word documents as far as looking it up. You know what, uh, Nicole, are you? present and accounted for uh is it and i haven't shared anything in the in the chat room that's why i would rather if i if we can we split up into three groups and what i want to do before we split up into three groups 
I would like to share three files because I don't know what group you're going in, but I'd like to share three files, actually three Word documents in the chat. So if you wouldn't mind, if you could grab all of those, that would be, that would be awesome before you go into your breakout yeah. rooms. It keeps telling me the file's in use, and I know I just closed it. So, let me see something. I'll try this. No, I don't want to leave meeting. I may not be able to. Well, again, lesson learned. But. Kev, you want to, eat, you want to try to email them to me real quick, and I'll see if I can stick them in the chat fast? Um, sure. Anybody's got any questions or any comments or any stories? No, I just appreciate you uh, putting that uh, together. Um, Kevin, I know that you guys, you know, when this all came out, you guys really dug in deep to, to put this material out, but you weren't afraid to uh, send it up and say brand it and use it and share it and all that. So, Thanks, Ken. Uh, it's, it's just what others have done with me. I mean, everybody is... Uh, Everybody's been great. I, I never this. So on the, the answered, ANSI standard committee uh, that meets twice a year, uh, the standards are actually reviewed and looked at every five years. So, you know, every ANSI standard that's, that's out there goes through a subcommittee that actually reviews those uh, particular standards and makes uh, opinions and suggestions that the voting group votes on uh, so there's 75 voting members on that group and then 25 uh um um i can't think of the name now uh, of the uh the ones that are are in line to either become a voting member or not but um those uh those standards are being looked at every year like this last year they wanted to try to change our group wanted to try to change the uh, terms and definitions of competent and qualified persons of course it got voted down but uh, that's just some of the stuff that you run into with when you're in those groups so i'm saying that because being involved you know if it's safety or whatever type of committees that you can get on staying involved is very very important because you got if you're not involved you got other people making decisions for you Absolutely, and that's an honor to be on that. And we're blessed to have a lot of uh, a lot of the organized labor as as being recognized on that, like uh, Ken, like Spencer has been. Um, we were kicked off of that five years ago for non-participation within the ANSI standard group. I had to stand in front of two hundred people and eat crow to get us back on. Um, mm. So it's just important to stay active you got to stay active and if you're not going to be active and get somebody that takes your place before you start not showing up good stuff though it's important to be on those groups got and what i've got i'm going to throw these on i'm able to add these um they are the different segments i've turned that PowerPoint into a PDF and like so group one would actually be working with the with the PowerPoint or the mod one group two would be working with the mod two and like I said I'm hoping that it's it's, it's kind of hard to do in an hour but and, and group three would be working with group three so I do have those that I was able to throw up there. If you guys could, I don't know if you could grab those or not, because again, I'm not sure which, which question you're gonna get or which group you're gonna be in. So if you could grab them all, then whenever we get the uh, word files up with the questions, maybe we could spend about 10 minutes on them just looking through this stuff. Again, I, I, I do firmly believe, I'm going to try this again. Hey, it worked. So maybe my computer was just trying to, hadn't closed out yet. Nicole, I do, I was able to add that. 
uh, where's the others? Group two. And group three. So if you're in group three, you'd be using the group three questions. Um, same thing with group, group two, group one. And you would be using the PowerPoint or the PDF for mod one if you're in group one, mod two for group two, mod three for group three. how long you want to breakout rooms to last? Uh, I'm thinking 10 minutes is about all we're going to be able to get. All right, so we're going, going to do... To about two. All right, so these rooms are good. We're going to do three rooms. It'll automatically put you in, so you guys won't have to click anything like last time. Sorry about that. Um, and then the group one, two, and three, the documents are now in the chat, so you can grab that depending on what group you go into. We'll do the automatic timer with a minute left. And I'm going to open the rooms now, and we'll see you all in 10 minutes. Anything else? Awesome. Heather? No, that's it. Thank you very much. Sure. There's a... Uh... Six, eight of us, nine of us. Nicole's in here too. So there's uh, there's eight of us on the phone. Um, has everybody got the? Uh, I think we're in group one, correct? Yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't see it. In group. The chat. I so don't I got the document. The I got the document up for group one, and I can read the questions, and they're true or false. If somebody just wants to write down uh, the true or false for me, I can read the question for you. And I'll just start with question. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Ed. So I'll, I'll read the question. It's just a question, and then it's an answer, A or B, for true and false. And I'll just, if you can't, if you don't have the group one document, if I can just, like I said, get somebody to write down whatever we agree on the answer to be, then uh, we can report back with that. But it says, uh, though the occupant, this is question one, though the occupant is not in control of the movements of a MWEP, they must still be trained in safe in the safe use of the MWEP, FPS, MUPS. True, true. So somebody write that down so we have that answer. So number two, the rescue plan must take into consideration a mechanical breakdown of the MUPS platform, entanglement or fall from the platform. True. True. Okay, we all agree on that? Yep. Number three, the 2018 changes to the ANSI lift standards for use and training of MUPS only affects a large contractor. False. 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 Number four, this training consists of everything in the new ANSI A92 standard and no further training is needed. False. False. False, I would say false, yep. Yeah. Because uh, we got site specific and all that other stuff that's yeah. involved. Yeah. Right. 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 Rest number five and the final question. It looks like uh, number five. Rescue plans are required to be. Rescue plans are required to be a written, b in place before MUPS use, c known by all affected employees, d all the above. Written to minimize the risk of uh, suspension trauma, and then E all of the answers. Yep. Yeah, yeah one of them, all of the above. All of them. Yep. Yeah. So, did somebody track those uh, answers? I got yeah. them. I got them. Nice. He crossed them out. True. Which of the following is not part of the site risk assessment? A, risk involved in the task must be identified. Procedures and measures must be identified to eliminate known risk. 
Identify measures and procedures must be implemented to eliminate known risk. Perform an annual maintenance. Annual maintenance. D. Yep. D. <clears throat> the supervisor and blank are responsible for the safety of the person not involved in the operation of the MEWP rental company user safety officer journeyman. B. The user B. Okay. Operator trainer must now also include proper selection of the current MEWP for the work mm -hmm. to be performed. How to perform the workplace risk workplace assessment, rescue. including rescue plan. See, see proper training of the equipment or all of the above. All of the above. D. Oh, D, all of the above. Uh, occupant training does not include the requirement of the use of fall protection in the location of fall protection anchors. Helping e. the occupant write the res rescue plan. Factors including how their actions could uh, affect stability. Manufacturers warning and instructions. B. No. <clears throat> Helping the occupant write B. the rescue plan. B. Okay. There's a page two. Oh, there's another. Oh, there it is. Okay, seven. At least one of the occupants must be provided with the knowledge and the operated, operate the controls in and windy condition, demonstration, emergency, none of the answers. C. Emergency. Supervisor must be trained in these additional areas. Proper selection of the correct MEWP for the work to be performed. Hands-on portions of the lift training. The ability to perform a workplace risk assessment, including rescue plan, A and B. A and B? Mm hmm I would say so. Anybody sure. else? Mm -hmm. Anybody concur? Supervisors and users must have the ability to perform a workplace blank, including rescue plan, frequent inspections, annual inspection, risk assessment, and bid inspections. C. I would go back to eight. I would think, eight. I don't know. I, but I'm still Supervisors I must be, be the ability to perform the workplace, a rescue plan, and including frequent inspection, risk assessment. You say A? Yeah, but if you put A, it doesn't even make sense with the wording of the sentence. Right. Risk assessment, including risk, frequent inspections, including risk plan, annual inspections, including rescue plan. Risk no, but you got to read the beginning of the sentence, too. Supervisor yeah, okay. Use it doesn't make sense with the wording. Uh, okay, so, so which one? So let's put it in there. Supervisors and users must have the ability to perform a workplace risk assessment. No, supervisors and users must have the ability to perform a workplace. I'm gonna go a workplace frequent inspections isn't proper English. So if that's right. their answer, then there's something wrong. Okay, a I workplace think, risk uh, assessment. If there was <laughs> frequent it's inspections of the workplace. It's it's just that the first glance would it look cool. It's not arguing the verbs or anything. You guys are on the right track. C is actually correct because it's risk assessment, including a rescue plan. And that's why I say number eight, it should be all the above, not just A and B. And remember the supervisors don't have to do the hands-on portion. Correct. And eight is number C, that's it? Yeah, what? I don't see D. Why would they have the bid uh, inspections? I'm talking about a number eight going back up. Okay, go back to say a supervisor must be trained in additional areas. So the foreign workplace uh, risk assessment, including rescue planning. I think it should be C or all the above. Let's see. Not D. You guys all pick D. Mm -hmm. What's your fish train out there? hands-on push. Oh yeah, because he said that they don't have to know how to run the lift. They just have to know how to assess things. Right, they just got to do the, uh, they just the work assessment, the including rescue plan. Okay. I think it'd be C. Okay, I changed it. 
I think that's it, right? Yep, yeah, there's nine. Any other ones you want to go over? How many seconds do we have left? Once we run out of time, it just usually throws us right back in. Okay, so. Um, um, uh, provision in this standard and the update for older for, for the equipment itself yes yes yeah just like whatever the changes standards of the of the scaffolding which you know scissors left so fall in that but but whenever they changed it utilize the equipment that previously was if you're using it within the, the manufacturer's recommendations of of whenever it was manufactured does that make sense so yeah, as and and that's where if they come up with any updates, though, we want to make sure that they know we're out of here and that that we can they can send them to us, which they will do. It's much better if they send them to us than it is if we've got to constantly Kevin, you're on mute. Every time we switch, we get put back on auto mute. <laughs> so that's a good thing most of the time. Been times I wish it was on for sure. Does anybody have any questions on this? I don't know how much of it you'll be able to utilize or how much you're able to get in the PDFs. Um, those will be available if anybody wants to. Veronica? They're not up there again. They're gone. Okay. Um, right. I, I got two and three, but I didn't down, download number one didn't come, but we got two and three. Okay. Um, again, I will, I've got everybody's email address. What I'll do, I'll just, I'll shoot you this zip folder that's got everything that I've got um, in, in our right coursework right. on that. Might be coming back up. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate it. I mean, it's just like Nicole, um, you know, what a resource her and Manisha and Alice, all of them. Tremendous resource. Ronald. We, Ronald, absolutely. There's no way we couldn't, we could do none of this really uh, without them, period. So. You're absolutely right, Kevin. If we did not have the professionals in the background that keeps us in check, we could not do our jobs. Absolutely. Nope. Everybody up there is tremendous. Appreciate and without it. Without you guys and without our men out in the field, we also know that we would not be needed, so all good. It's part of a team, right? It's the beauty of a team. I can't wait for the Zoom lesson because I just learned how to share my screen in the room. Well, I could see I need a little bit more work on on, on some of my sharing stuff. She was only that caught the test quiz before you sent us to the private room, so we had to teach her how to navigate through it all. <laughs> <laughs> so we <laughs> Well, you guys, you got any, you got any closing questions on any of this? Like I said, I'm more than happy to share the, the zip drive with you. Should have everything. And it's got the test, it's got the written test. Naturally, it's at the, uh, so the answer sheet, you know, kind of the difficulties of the questions. Um, and the PowerPoint has that built in. Uh, if you would just want to do it as a review at the very end of it, too. But again, if you want to give it as a test, you may not want to do the review. So if, and we can upload anything that you want to, Kev, in the right. uh, LMS awesome. um, for the actual class itself. So when you get your materials, you can just go right in there and all of these things can be in there as well. So whatever you guys want or need, that's where we'll put Thanks, it. Thanks, Nicole. And we'll send that link out to you all, too, so you have it. All right. Awesome. I appreciate that. Hey, Nicole, well, you guys? Nicole, can, can we... Uh, stick around for just a minute and have Jason and Nick Cartina hang out for just a second with me because I want to I, I still need signatures on the sign-in sheet and those we did something to screw it up so <laughs> if you guys All don't right. mind hanging around for a couple minutes but we'll talk after everybody else goes who has to stay Absolutely. Nicholas and Jason All right, if nobody's got 
any other questions, I will see you guys in the morning. And we're going to be talking about hazard communication uh, GHS system tomorrow morning whenever we get kicked off. Then we got to Zoom and online training with David, uh, PowerPoint with David, and uh, that's development. So he's going to show you some nifty. Uh, tomorrow's going to be heavy on the visual. So visual aids by, by Phil Harper is going to close us out. So thanks a lot again, everybody. Uh, David and Phil did great. Appreciate everybody's participation. Thanks, and everyone. Patience. All right, thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Yes, ladies. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so uh, Nick, did you actually sign the sign-in?